All right, we're ready to go. Okay, everybody's mics on. Um, all right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are already in session. We had an executive session uh, prior to uh, our regular session. And uh, this is the July 2nd, 2018 regular meeting of Village Council. And uh, we're gonna start out with any announcements. I have two. Okay. So um, our beloved 4th of July parade is happening on 4th of July, Wednesday. And if you want to be in it, come to the Friends Care uh, Center. That's uh, lining up at 2 o'clock. Parade starts at 3. Fireworks will be at Gaunt Park. And I think they start at 10. That's what I saw. It doesn't say here. Yeah, I want to get dark. Oh, okay, it dark. says dark, but I saw 10. Yeah. Um, then on the 13th, which is next, next week, uh, in, in Clifton, at the Clifton Opera House, there's going to be a showing of uh, a movie called The Call of the Little Miami, and it's celebrating 50 years of the Scenic River Act. Hope Taft will be there. She's one of my heroes. And um, so I invite you to come to that. The, I, I'm hopeful that there will be something in the paper about that next week. Great. Those are my notes. Okay, thanks. I have one. Lisa? Yeah, that you, uh, for those of you who've been here, you may have noticed that there is uh, different art hanging up outside than there, than there was prior, and that's part of the uh, permanent collection of the Arts Council and the John Bryan Community Gallery. Um, at the last council meeting, I announced that there was going to be a, a sort of a reception to um, celebrate that, but uh, that won't be happening this month. Of course, people are invited to come and look at the art anytime they want. Um, but there will be one probably in uh, September, some sort of reception um, for this show that's called Remembering. That's artists from Yellow Springs who have passed on. And then there'll be a sister show in the building um, of uh, village portraits that were rendered by Alan Macbeth. So we'll keep you posted on that event. Okay, so July 6th. July 6th is off. Okay, great. Patty? Um, yes, I have two announcements. One is that Miller Pipeline is doing some work for Vectran Energy on gas line replacement project in the village. Um, the areas involved uh, in this include North Stafford between Pleasant and Dayton Street, North High between Pleasant and Dayton Street, and North Winter between Pleasant and Dayton Street. Also Lincoln Court, Union Street, and Pleasant Street from Stafford to High. So if you live in any of those areas, you will see uh, Vectran or Miller Pipeline in the area working for Vectran. They started today. Um, I'm not sure how long the project goes, but just be aware that that is happening. And also, I'd like to make uh, another announcement about if you um, own property that abuts an alleyway, please remember that you are responsible for keeping the alleyway trimmed and mowed. Um, we do have have had some recent complaints about that, so. We're making the announcement in the hope that everyone will just um, remember to do that and Denise won't have to send out a whole bunch of letters, which would make Denise very happy. So remember if you have property that does abut an alley, it is your responsibility to keep the brush trim back. And if there's pothole or you need gravel, let us know, we'll take care of that. But the brush and the grass, if it's a grassed alley, that's your responsibility. So I just, I wanna follow up, because I do have an alley. Yes, ma'am. So grass grows up in the middle of the alley. So you're saying that property owners are supposed to get into the alley itself? And yes, you, yes, you're supposed to mow that. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and so I have a couple other announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to reiterate what I heard Judy say, um, which is we do have the sign-in sheet. So if you are planning to speak, please put your name and what topic uh, you're going to speak to, um, because that will help us to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity who's here to say something uh, gets that chance. Um, the other thing is I wanted to mention a few amazing things that happened this past weekend. Um, first of all, Yellow Springs Pride. If you were not out for that on Saturday, it, it was really great. Um, they did a really nice job of setting up everything over at the Peaches parking lot. Um, my understanding is that they've got the space reserved for next year and they'll be back at the Bryan Center. That goes through um, Sam, yeah. And I did want to put uh, sort of a thought in council's mind that 
This to me seems like an event that the village maybe should have uh, more of a role in supporting. And uh, someone pulled me aside at the event um, from West Virginia, and she mentioned the town of Huntington, West Virginia, where they had a coordinator who helped organize those activities. And uh, I kind of looked over at you, Florence, because uh, it seems <laughs> like that might be something for our community outreach specialist to potentially <laughs> get into um, so we can talk more about that later but um, yeah but it was I, I mean it was amazing what they did but you know having banners up and really showing that we do have pride uh, would be a nice thing to think about um, the second thing was we passed a resolution for the Hugh O'Brien youth um, who were in village in the village for four days there were 212 uh, youth from not just Southwest Ohio, but also Indiana, Pennsylvania, et cetera. Um, and they did a variety of community service activities. Uh, Judy, this is one that I thought about with you because you helped with the coordinating. They're going to be coming back to Antioch College next year and probably moving forward. They realized it's a great fit. And I was at their closing ceremony and was just so wowed. And it would be great to coordinate an activity with the village, and I thought that might be something you might enjoy. Yes. Um, but I, I really was impressed. And then uh, finally, I wanted to mention uh, the Women's Park celebrating their 20th anniversary. The flowers look amazing right now. And it's just incredible that 20 years ago, a group got together and carved out that part on the bike path I rarely see things like this, and I go, I go to bike trails all the time. And, um, and this is something that I think we should commemorate, and I think the Arts and Culture Commission is going to talk more about doing that. Um, so anyway, uh, those are the announcements. And with that, uh, anything else before we move to the consent agenda? OK. We have two items on the consent agenda. We have the minutes from our last meeting on June 18th as well as a, a resolution um, for check signing privileges. So I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor signify. We, oh, yes. I have a question, though. We yes. had something at the council table. Does that mean there were some typos or something that was changed? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So and I have a question about uh, nominations for commissions where does that go on the agenda uh when we talk about um uh the agenda planning for the meeting okay. we can add that review, in okay review. yeah review of the agenda yeah. yeah right um okay all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye 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 okay and so kevin that was a perfect segue review of the agenda would you like to add something yeah i have um, an individual that uh we want to nominate for HRC is full member of uh, the Human Relations Commission. Okay, great. Um, Where will we do that? We'll do that under new business. Okay. Anything else for the agenda? Um, I I would like to have an update on where we stand with the recommendation about cases going to the mayor's court. Could we put that under old business? Sure. Okay. I'm sorry. Where we, I understood that we had passed, we had said to the police department, please let us know the kind of cases you think that could go to mayor's court. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think should. We had a meeting today. So. And um, that was two months ago, I think. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'd like to know where that is. I we can do that. that. Okay. So. All right. Anything else regarding the agenda? Okay, if not, um, Marianne, if you want to walk us through yes. petitions and communications. Yeah. So we had a number of uh, letters of support regarding uh, Officer Meister, uh, one from Liz Porter, one from Jessica Thomas, from Libby and Dan Rudolph, from John Hudson, uh, Lou Cassidy, Joan Horn and David Hirschen. And then we had a few uh, letters or emails, petitions, whatever, from some other people. Patty Dallas 
suggested that housing on the glass farm be rental housing and that there be a housing commission in support of that. Uh, Judith Empling uh, sent out a proposal for uh, a justice system commission for council. I don't know. It's a process. It's it was just process. a process thing mm -hmm. I had said I would update you. Um, Patty Bates uh, sent out clarifications on police department procedures involving um, police training when police, some of the training police do, do is online through um, the Ohio, what? Ohio, Ohio Peace Officers Training. Ohio Police Officers, Officers Training, and they can do it online, and then um, the village gets reimbursed. Sometimes they work for more than the village and someone else, so some other agency gets reimbursed. At, at any rate, it was uh, just clarifying with council, the kind, not the kind of training, but sort of how the officers do that and how they get reimbursed, uh, and some other things about payroll issues. And then finally, we got a notice from the Ohio EPA that the uh, Fairborn Cement Companies wants to do some uh, querying uh, of limestone and dump uh, polluted water into uh, Ludlow Creek and Connor Branch and two wetlands. And uh, we're in the process, we, I mean, the village and the Environmental Commission and Tecumseh Land Trust uh, of figuring out where that location is. It will it dump water into the Little Miami River which, as I mentioned earlier, is a scenic river, and there is a little video about that. So not a good thing, I don't think. So that's the end of that. All right. Thanks, Marianne. Um, before we get into uh, legislation, uh, and, and that has to happen before citizen concerns, again, for folks that just came in, I want to mention that we do have a sign-in sheet uh, right by Lisa there. If you are planning to speak tonight, please uh, add your name and what topic you're speaking on. Uh, so let's get into uh, legislation. And first we have Ordinance 2018-25. Uh, Judy, uh, I think we can read that in title Wait. only. All right. <clears throat> this is repealing Chapter 876 Wireless Services of the Codified Ordinances of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Chapter 876 Small Cell Facilities and Wireless Support Structures, and declaring an emergency. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. I move. Second. Okay. And uh, this is a second reading, so we will be uh, having a public hearing. But uh, Chris, why don't you uh, start us off with an overview of sort of what you wrote up? Okay, cool. Uh, we, we presented the legislation uh, at the last council meeting. Uh, it was a first reading, but there was no vote taken. Uh, council had some questions uh, regarding uh, control of aesthetics, uh, the impact on potential broadband development within the village, uh, and uh, an appeal process. Uh, I'm here with Jennifer Gruy, who's uh, helps on these projects. We had a couple phone conferences uh, last week. Denise is here as well to answer questions, and Denise and Jennifer probably have the most knowledge of anybody in the room. Uh, the short answers to the questions that were presented uh, at last council meeting and the answers that we have are, uh, I'll deal with the, the one that's the, the probably the most uh, nebulous, which is the broadband. And as I understand it, the answer uh, depends. I think Patty can, uh, can uh, amplify that. Uh, there should be no impact on broadband, but it, it depends on, on how it's structured and, and how, where these mini cells go. I think that there's an estimate that the total number of mini cells that might go in the village is less than 10, probably about five. Is that right, Denise? Um, and uh, keeping in mind that the idea is of a mini cell is to enhance Wi-Fi capabilities within areas where there's a high density population that allows the cell towers to be more effective to those people who live in the hinterlands farther away from the, the uh, city center. Can I ignore you for a second because yeah. I've inadvertently caused confusion. Um, I just threw out into the audience, not in the form of a paper airplane, but almost <laughs> a copy of the picture that we're looking at right now, because the last time 
that we met when we started to talk about these mini cell towers, we didn't know what they looked like. And so that's a picture of some. So you'll know what we're talking about. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, thank, thank <laughs> Next you, time, Lisa. paper airplane. <laughs> the, uh, and, and that's a great point. Um, there are many designs that are out there. So we don't know exactly what designs companies may rely upon. Um, and if anybody wants to just do a Google search, what do mini cell towers look like, you'll see all kinds. Uh, admittedly, some of them are uh, not aesthetically pleasing. Um, there have been some standards as much as we're allowed to put into the code put in there. Um, and the plan is, is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, but uh, the zoning administrator has the first round of approval. Approval. No. no. Uh, the, uh Public works. Public works, okay. And then, uh, why don't you to address that? Sure. <laughs> um, so the public works is gonna be the first line of reviewing these applications. They're gonna come in. There's gonna be a lot of documents that are required as part of these applications. Um, that's identified in the legislation. Uh, Denise will take a look and make sure all those documents are there and then it'll be forwarded to the public works department. Um, so just in terms of the solic solicitor's report that was submitted to you, um, it includes in there the purposes and principles behind um, House Bill 478, which will be enacted at the end of the month. Um, so some of the overarching principles are that uh, these are coming. Um, they're coming to bigger communities, they're coming to smaller communities, but they're for the benefit of the citizens of, of our community. Uh, we're really limited in what we can deny and accept. It's clearly outlined in there. Um, we've created some uh, aesthetic options for us in there and giving us a little bit of leeway in terms of matching the, you know, uh, surrounding scenery, matching, you know, concealing it when possible, um, those kinds of things. We've also added that we'd like them first to be placed in alleyways on utility poles, so hopefully they're not in the public purview as much as they would be in the alleyways. And the law technically says that we don't have to let them, we don't, we can't, we can deny them on our polls, but then they could put their own poll up. Is that right? So in terms of the poll itself, if they would like to place it on a poll and it, in terms of the requirements, if it's in a location requirement, if we are, if they've identified and uh, completed the necessary steps, then yes, they can place on the poll. However, if the poll is, does not have the integrity, integrity to have that device placed on it, then they can replace the poll, but it still remains our poll. We would still own the replaced poll. They're just replacing it so that it's structurally capable of handling these multiple cell facilities. Okay, and, and, and it's this, the company that makes that assessment in terms of the integrity of the poll? In terms of the integrity, that would be something that our public works, which is why they're best suited to handle these at, at the outset. They're going to know that what these polls can handle and what they cannot. Okay, but but replacing strictly replacing our poll, not adding additional polls. They could add additional polls. Um, that's again part of the leeway that they have as part of this house bill. So, the previous version of the bill that was actually a Senate bill um, allowed for these small cell operators to come in without contacting the village. They could place the poll and put it up wherever they wanted. And that's what happened with the year of litigation and that was one part of the negotiation. So oh. that's a long-winded way to say, we can't stop it. We have certain items in our legislation that protect us the, to the best we can, but oh. there is a lot of leeway for these companies. Um, again, we, in terms of where they're likely to be placed first, hopefully it's in an alleyways, but we can't guarantee that. Mm -hmm. And when the poles need to be replaced, who t takes them off and on? It will be the small cell operator's responsibility to take, the, to take the small cell off of it. There's a little bit of abandonment language in there, so if a small cell is abandoned, if it's not used within 365 days, then it's, 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 just it's yeah. abandoned, correct. And, and we would move our electric lines. Judith, if that's what you're asking, the village would. No, yeah, no, I was wondering okay. about those particular things that aren't ours. Okay. Denise, did you have anything additional that you wanted to add? Uh, I've got a couple of things. One is the, the Public Works Department handles the initial application. Uh, if there is a challenge to that determination, it goes to Patty, and then I, we've set it up so that the final determination would then go to Council. Um, we think that's unlikely to happen, given the, the few numbers of requests that will be. Um, in addition, uh, we've looked at the fees, and I think that we've charged the maximum amount we can by law. Right. Um, and uh, the last piece is that we will need to approve this by emergency legislation. Um, in theory, we could do it today, 
um, since we have a, a second reading. However, if you want to have another reading at the next council meeting, you could pass it that way by emergency legislation as long as it takes effect immediately upon passage because the effective date of the new laws is August 1st. All right. Um, okay, so I, I appreciate some of the cleanup that was done. And really the only question left that I put on the table last time was in the prior version of this legislation, the process was it comes to the village manager and application and then it comes to council. Um, do you want to begin with, I, I think it was alluded to in your report, Chris, why you're recommending a different process, but do you want to maybe highlight why, why we're not carrying that process over? Well, that process is, is still there. The appeals process. From no, this is, right. wasn't, this wasn't the appeal. If you look in the old the legis approval. legislation, okay. yeah. the approval, it always came to council. So, well, at one, we don't think that we should burden council with that because it's not necessary. If, there, if, if it could be worked out at the administrative staff level, uh, the, the way we handle most of our, our zoning pieces, although this is not a zoning piece, uh, it just didn't make any sense to put that on council's plate when there's plenty to do. And if it can be worked out through public works, uh, so what do you think was behind the policy before then? Why did? You know, I, I think that in larger communities where they've got historical districts and they've got some residential pieces, I just think it's it, it from the larger communities. Um, we looked at Kettering, we looked at Dublin, they were kind of the models that we followed. Uh, and Jennifer, maybe I can maybe answer this better than I can. But I just think that we looked at the practicalities of, of what we're dealing with here in the village. We're a small community. We're not going to be, we don't believe, burdened by requests, inundated with requests. We think that there's going to be reasonable solutions by reasonable people to uh, find locations for these units that will not be a, a problem or an eyesore to the community. Okay. And, and if they are, and we have reasons that we want to uh, challenge that, then the perfect place to go would be to the elected officials to have the final say. But frankly, with the structure that's set up, that the belief would be that if public works can't resolve the issues, they have a process by which they can get to the manager in that intermediate area, and then maybe the, at the manager level, a problem could be worked out and then take it to council if necessary. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments from council? Um, so since this is a public hearing, any questions or comments from uh, citizens? Megan? Megan Bachman, Yale Springs News. Um, I'm wondering if um, the residents of an area where this is going will be contacted at all and have any ability to question it based upon potential health concerns, EMF radiation. Do you want to address it, Denise, or do you want me to? Um, <clears throat> typically, that uh, process would be a public hearing. <clears throat> this is not allowed to be in the zoning code. So the answer to that is no. Okay. But there, there is uh, guidance in the legislation right. that's protecting public health. We, I mean, <clears throat> we're trying, yes, absolutely. And we're, and we're also trying to keep these in, as Jennifer had mentioned, alleyways um, in certain residential areas we, <clears throat> where there's um, underground utilities that won't be able to locate in that, that area. Um, I mean, if it <clears throat> does become a concern, I'm, you know, we definitely would try to address it somehow. And I think that from our talks with, in the past couple of years with um, cell companies, I think they're willing to work with us. They, they, they don't want to be a pain to us. So mm -hmm. we're, we don't, we don't, we're not concerned about it. Yeah, and, and Brian, as you noted, there are limitations on the, the frequency levels and all of that in the legislation that they have to abide by, and those are um, FCC regulations, um, essentially. So okay. we're probably looking at a couple more years before the technology actually is starts begins. Um, this is just they're laying the groundwork right now. You see fiber optic going in um, around town, and um, <clears throat> this 5G. If people, if everyone doesn't understand what it is. It's the, just the fifth generation of, of the technology. You know, first generation was analog voice. Second generation was 
voice and text. Third and fourth became larger increases in the amount of data. And now this 5G is really taking it to a completely different level where not only are, are the, the uh, it, it being a smartphone, <coughs> excuse me, and a tablet, being able to work with each other, now it'll be multiple different kinds of devices that will be able to work with each other. You'll end up having smart traffic signals, smart cars, smart cities, smart buildings. This will all be integrated and it'll be at a, a completely fast level. I mean, we're talking one to 10 gigabits compared to what's been in the past. So it's going to be rapid. I know the, my kids will love it because they'll be able right. to download a movie yeah. in a minute, a second. <laughs> but just to clarify, that's just for cell phones. Not, we're not talking about internet, like broadband internet or anything like that. Well, this is my understanding that the 5G is going to be able to be across. It'll, it'll be able to work with everything. It's, 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 it has to do with the, the, rap, the, the rapid data transmission. Mm. So, the, so the fiber optics that they're stringing, because I know that we've been working on a, uh, an agreement with a company here just recently, and so the 5G that they're stringing in preparation for these small cell towers, you're saying would potentially uh, be able to be picked up by Wi-Fi with someone's computer if you have the right. The, fi the 5G um, will enable the, the, the data to, to transfer more rapidly than in the past. And I'm not an engineer, but that's how I understood it to be. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. I won't add anything. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to get into the weeds on the, <laughs> yeah. the techie stuff. Um, okay, uh, any other questions or comments? All right, if not, um, let's go ahead and take a vote. And um, are you doing this as a second read? Uh, we are doing this as a second read, yes. Oh, second reading, but we didn't vote. Right, right, we didn't vote the first time. So, Judy, if you could do the roll call, please. Yeah, no problem. Hempfling. Did you open the public hearing? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, I already opened it. You, you didn't close okay. it, which might be a good idea. All right, well, uh, yeah, we're right. So I will officially close the public hearing. And there were no comments. Uh, we can note that too. Um, okay. Hempfling. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Couch. Yes. Okay. Uh, so now we have Ordinance 2018 27. Uh, Judy, I think again we can do that title only. No, actually, let's read it in full. Okay. This is amending section 1040.03 annual late fee utility forgiveness upon customer request. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs provides utility services for electric water, sewer, and solid waste, collectively village utility services, to all residents and businesses eligible for said services within the village. And whereas the village of Yellow Springs is committed to a service-oriented, non-punitive relationship with the community. And whereas it is recognized that a delayed village utility services payment may be due to an oversight, oversight or other factors. And whereas the village is committed to providing affordable village utility services in furtherance of the village's goal to create and sustain affordable housing. And whereas village council has determined that it is a reasonable exercise of its home rule powers to authorize a one time each calendar year forgiveness of the 5% late fee for the consolidate village bill for electric, water, sewer, and solid waste for residential users only. Now therefore council for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby ordains that. Section 1, a modification to Section 1040.03, non-payment of utility charges, delinquent status charges, of the codified ordinances of Yellow Springs, Ohio, is hereby amended to read as set forth in Exhibit A, which is attached here to and incorporated herein by reference. Section 2, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, Lisa? Yes. This um, is a second reading of this ordinance. Um, to forgive one time an annual, uh, a late fee for all utilities. Uh, we acknowledge that this isn't the um, hugest impact on your spending for your utility bills, but also understand that people have um, situations where they're late to pay their bill just because they forgot about it or something came up in their lives or the envelope sitting in the back seat of their car and that in those cases uh, they shouldn't have to pay uh, a late fee. Um, I want to point out that this is really only a first step um, for us to address utility concerns 
in the village. Later in this meeting today, we're going to talk about another initiative, the utility roundup that's making progress. And uh, we're also talking about a phase two of, not tonight, but in the future, a phase two of um, uh, both actions and changes potentially in the structure of the utility bills. So this is a first step, and I'm glad we've been able to get it to this point. All right, great. Um, and Patty, just a confirmation. So we decided we just needed to make this one change. Do you want to go? Judy? Go ahead. The initial ordinance changed only the electric rate. Right. So um, it was determined that it would be an easier sort of way to address the bill in its entirety to amend a different section of the code rather than each section, electric, water, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is, in fact, a completely different ordinance. So it is a first read of that right. change mm -hmm. ordinance, yes. Well, thank you for catching that because I think at the last meeting we thought we were going to have to do three right. separate right. Right. ordinances. So this is right. helpful. But it means that it's the first reading? Correct. There, okay. was, there were substantive changes made. Got it. So it needed thank to be you. A new ordinance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments? All right. Did anybody sign up on that list to speak about this topic? I doubt it. All right. <laughs> so, uh, and, and there will be a second reading. Uh, so we will have a public hearing at our next meeting. Um, but let's go ahead and Judy, if we can do the roll call. Yes, McQueen. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Hempfling. Yes. Hausch. Yes. All right, let's move on to resolution 2018-24. And uh, Judy, you can read that in by title only, please. Yes, this is approving the finance director's 2019 tax budget for the village of Yellow Springs. All right, I'll entertain a motion. I move. Second. Okay, uh, Colleen. Colleen is here. Where is she? There she is. Her first right. official meeting. All right, welcome Colleen, our new finance director. Thank you. Have a big crowd today. Yeah. So, Just for you. <laughs> They all came to see the, the to see my tax budget. Yeah, it's so interesting. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, for those of you that um, might be new on council, you know, I'll, I'll try to address any questions that I can. The tax budget is a yearly requirement for us to be able to receive the property taxes that the county gives us the amounts to work with on our budget. The rest of what we put together at this point is our. Um, other income that we have that supports a it's a preliminary for our annual budget that we'll be working on at the end of the year for 2019 so basically again this requirement is from the county they give us the amounts that they um, offer for the um, property tax we incorporate that in with our other revenues and then we put a history with it of the, um, our budget that we have this year, the two years prior on all the actuals, and then estimated ending balances. They wanna make sure that we'll have enough money coming in to meet our obligations. And that is the general idea of the tax budget. Okay. Um, questions or comments? Is this similar to what you would have done in your former position? Yes, yes. Everything's, every city has the, if you have the property tax, which they do, they're all similar. Forms are a little different, but the process is the same. Still go with the history, we go with our current budget, and then we estimate our best for what we'll need for 2019. And that just starts making the template that we'll work and trim off and add to at the end of the year when we start our actual budget for next mm -hmm. year. So, and is this aligned with our year-to-year -year budget cycle? Aligned with? I mean, so we're talking about January to December 2019? Yes. Okay. So, I did have some questions about the, um, the part about uh, capital improvements, or it's got a different title here. Um, and, and I guess I just wondered, first of all, what are mobile data terminals well they're in the police cars okay all right that's what i thought and then uh the pole replacement that's being referred to here this is not 
what's happening right now? Actually, it's part of it because the capital budget that we had created for, for the next several years uh -huh. had so much per year. So okay. if, if we choose to move forward with the RFP when it comes in, then that would actually disappear from the capital budget and or be changed in the capital budget. Okay. What about the 50000 a year that we uh, do for sidewalk improvements? That doesn't need to show up on here? Um, it is a regularly recurring item. I don't know if it's folded into one of the other things here. Um, do you know, which, Coley? Which fund are we talking about? Um, so I, it will come out of the general fund for sidewalks. So we have a policy of every year we commit 50000 to sidewalk improvements. Mm -hmm. Are you calling it the green space? No. 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 That's something else. This is, yeah, part of infrastructure. Be where the but yeah, yeah streets. these streets. Okay. And that's not as detailed in the tax budget because um, this part of our step for our budget is mainly addressing the two funds, the uh, pension, police pension, and the general fund because those are the, where we get our property tax from. Okay. The um, page five and page 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 five and six will just have um, the street, all the other funds that will be listed when we work on our 2019 actual budget. And these will have um, for the auditors our estimated ending fund balance um, at the end of this year what our budget that we'll be working on for 19 and what is available for appropriations. So they're in there, they're not detailed. I do have mm -hmm. the draft for the budget that we'll be going over in September, right. and I can look at that detail to find your answer. Okay, yeah, I mean, and I was mostly just more wondering with this document, I, why I didn't see those things or other improvements listed, mm -hmm. so. It's just mainly the general fund right now and the police okay. um, pension. Great. Okay. Anything else? Any okay. questions or comments from citizens? Yep. Your mind coming up? Going off the new plan that you brought to Yellow Springs? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not based on what was used in last year, like a template, because if you can't find the book and find one, could yep. you go on for a different template? He's um, probably asking for a detail that's not included in this part of the tax budget. And okay. this is all standard with all the municipalities <coughs> that use, um, through the auditor's offices. Through, based on the Yellow Springs history, not from yeah. where you came? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. And they're in here the last two years of the actuals for here okay. and our current budget and then our estimate for 2019 for Yellow Springs. Good question. <laughs> Thanks. And will you say your name for the Janice record? Johnson. Yes. Thanks, Janice. Okay, anything else? Okay. All right, thanks, Thank Colleen. Thank you, Colleen. Um, okay, so uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, one more piece of legislation, which is Resolution 2018 25. And, um, Julia, let's go ahead and read that in full. Sure. This is authorizing the village manager to submit an application to the Ohio Public Works Commission for the remote read water meter replacement project. Whereas the Ohio Public Works Commission, OPWC, annually solicits applications for grants for its public infrastructure projects. And whereas the Village of Yellow Springs staff is recommending submission of a remote read water meter replacement project for round 33 of the OPWC grant cycle to wit, the purchase and installation of remote read water meters to replace the existing aged and obsolete water meters. And whereas the Village has obtained an estimate for the purchase and installation of said remote read water meters in the amount of $818,480.79 and now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio that Section 1, the Village Managers is authorized to submit an application to District 11 of the Ohio Public Works Commission for the above described projects. Section 2, the resol this resolution shall go into effect at the earliest period allowed by law. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right, Patty. <coughs> um, so the OPWC, the way it works is you have to submit your grant application in July of this year to have the money become available July 1 of next year. Um, <coughs> normally you find out around October if you are going to be awarded the grant so that you can plan a little bit ahead. But 
the remote read water meters are important in several ways. Um, they, they will, first of all, several people have meters inside their homes. Um, if, we, if you're not home, we leave you a card. If you don't fill out the card and send it back to us, you may get an estimated read. And if you get an estimated read at some point, you're going to have a catch up bill, which is <coughs> never pleasant for anyone. Um, second of all, um, it helps with workers' comp claims because um, as opposed to having to go in and, and locate some of these meters, which are in fairly inaccessible spots, even on the outside of buildings, We've had numerous instances of our meters get our meter readers getting bitten by dogs and other things. But the most important uh, benefit that it has is that it allows a far more timely detection of water leaks. Because right now, if you have a water leak that happens to occur right after we've read your meter, you're going to go for 30 days before anybody realizes that you have a water leak. This will allow us every morning when, when the staff comes in, they will see, oh my gosh, somebody has a water leak. You know, Brian Housh has a water leak in his house. We need to call Brian. Brian can also access it on his smartphone. There's an app where you can access it on your smartphone so that you know you have a leak. And so you can see and call us and say, hey, my phone is telling me I have a water leak. Can somebody come and help me? So that will greatly reduce because if you have a water leak, um, we can give you certain allowances on it, but if it goes down your sewer, you, you're going to have to pay water and sewer. So if it's a leak in your toilet or it's a leak in your faucet and it's going down your sink or down your toilet, that just adds additional cost for you. I mean, the water is one thing, you have to pay that, but the sewer, you want to definitely avoid that. So. It's important that we be able to, to catch those leaks in a more timely manner. We're applying for the grant to cover 84%, at least we hope that it'd be 84%. Um, we definitely will not ask for a larger match than, than the 16% that's noted. Um, it's just a matter of Colleen and Johnny are working together to ensure that the water fund can support the part that we're gonna match with. <coughs> Um, you do get more points the more money that you put in towards the match, but it, it just comes down to what we can afford. Thank you. Okay. Judith, did you have a question? No, I didn't have a question. I guess I just wanted to say, I mean, this is one of the things I think staff's done very well over the last years in terms of getting these grants to pay for these more expensive uh, improvements to village, you know, the village. Um, sidewalks is a great example up there by uh, Fair Acres, uh, Fairfield Pike. That piece of sidewalk doesn't look that long, costs a lot of money to put it in though. And um, a lot of the money that uh, these grants, I mean we've gotten, the staff's done a great job of getting grants to help pay for these things and have paid high percentage of these improvements. So thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I think it's real, this is going to be really important for the community to have the water meters replaced. I think it'll have a, a major impact and prevent wasting water. And I was also pleasantly surprised at the turnaround time on the determination of the grant, that oh. they're able to do that so quickly. Yeah, they, they'll tell you that you're going to get it. You just don't get it for, for a year. <laughs> That's a start, uh, though. Yeah, it, it is. And it does give you a little you time. You can plan, because as Colleen not, uh, just <coughs> noted, we're going to be doing our budget probably around that time when mm -hmm. we figure it out. And the good news is if you don't get it in the first round, um, the village is considered a small government, and we get to go to small governments for potential different funding, which is another application, and I would have to come back to you. But if we don't make it in the first round, we will submit a small government's grant to try to get it in the second round. So. Okay. Thank you. Right. Any other questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? Yeah, Carlos, come up here, please. My name is Carlos Landaburu. Just out of curiosity, how much do they cost, the things? Uh, the, to do the, all the meters in the village for the software, the setup, the applications, all of that, it's $818,480.79. Um, the 16% match would be the 130,957. Thank you. So, okay. Thanks. Uh, yes. Emily Schultz. Um, I, in a city I lived in, in Columbus, a suburb, we did this before, and a lot of people 
came up afterwards really concerned about the EMS from having the water reader on their house. So will there be uh, a way for people to say, I don't want that on my house? Like will there, or will they all be forced to having it on their house if they don't want it? Um, when we did, the, we, we have remote read um, electric meters right now. Uh -huh. And when we did those, we made it a, an across the board thing. And we did have some folks that um, were upset about it. Yeah. And we, we talked to them and explained it. And, and at the end of the day, it was everyone seemed OK with it. OK, so that's probably this. There might not be ways to opt out. Right. OK, right. I'm just curious. Thank Thanks. you. I, I do remember at that time, we did, there was research done we, about right. health implications. Yeah. yeah, we did significant research on that. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Same Marianne, for mentioning yes. that. Yeah, I'm Mark Pulser. And uh, a few years ago, I replaced the water line in my house. And it, it previously had that indoor water meter mm -hmm. that was very hard to read. And I was complaining about it to a friend of mine who happened to be on the council here about 15 years ago. And he said, well, we, we appropriated money, and there was a plan. And, Put in place at that time to replace all these meters to move them all out yes yeah, so it was like 15 years ago mm -hmm. so i'm wondering was, was the grants not an issue at that point um, i honestly don't know the history back that far um you know it, whether it was or wasn't maybe judy can look it up for you if you want to um, send her an email and contact her she can send you that back okay um but at, the, at this point the the good news with remote read is we don't have to move your meter outside to read it well, it's outside now. I replaced okay. the line, and it is outside. Yeah. But, it's yeah. but for, for all the folks that are indoor, because we do have a regulation that says if you're going to change everything inside, you have to move it outside. Right, and, and I that, did that. Yeah, and we will still ask you to do that, but we don't have to, like, I saw that gentleman there, I'm sorry, not nodding his head when I said if you have a meter that's inside, we have to leave you a... Uh, a yeah. ticket, I think it was you, and then it just, it, it's much easier for folks who have the indoor meters because they don't have to worry about being home, they don't have to worry about calling us with the yeah, outdoor meters. You know. Yeah, it sort or of makes sense. Ones. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, it sounds like oh, I see. there wasn't any follow through. Any yeah, and, and, and honestly, I don't know the okay. history back that far again. Right. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Uh, Sharon? They put new uh, water lines and everything out my out by my house out mm -hmm. on Senior Avenue mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I was very surprised because there's this old brass meter in the basement, and they just moved the same meter out there. Mm -hmm. I mean that thing could have been hundred years old. I don't know, but I, I think it's not complicated. It's a little clock that measures the water it runs through. Mm -hmm. But they didn't put anything new out there. They just moved the old one. Yeah. G generally, a water meter has a life expectancy of 20 to 25 years. And, mm -hmm. and if they start to go bad, they generally read a little bit slower mm -hmm. than a little bit faster. Um, so if, it, if it's really old, <laughs> you're probably Better actually off. ahead of the game a little bit. <laughs> but, um, Enjoy it while it yeah. lasts. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, it, there are ways to test your water meter. Well, I'm not, I, I was just curious because you said they were putting in the new ones well, and they just did new lines and everything. Right. All well, the way into the but house. But the lines that we did on Xenia Avenue were water mains. Yeah. They weren't the lateral lines that go to folks' houses. Yeah, they did the my Did house they put a new lateral in yeah. for you? They yeah. must have had to dig it up for some reason. Then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, it, it, it was a mess. Okay. But they took the, I mean, it was like in behind my water here, just this antique looking thing. And I was really surprised when they did all this new stuff and they moved the meter. Yeah, some of our meters are, are pretty old, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And remember, please, first and last names. Oh, yes. Sharon Moeller. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so, any other comments? Um, okay, if not, I would like to uh, make a motion to add to the third whereas maybe a qualifier that says that this will cover 84, approximately 84%. I think it would be good to. Um, if be, you do that, and we have to put less, then it locks us in. If, okay. If, well, something just to qualify that you know, there's going to be some matching funds. So, what would you recommend? Um, 
just put can, matching can funds. we say with matching funds yeah i mean if you want to just put with matching funds i think that'll be fine i'm just if you put 84 percent and that's fine that. able to i mean i just want it to be clear that this is covering oh. you know doors i'll cover second them. that okay. okay okay so uh so then uh all those in favor of the amendment to the resolution signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. okay and then uh, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution as amended. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. So let me grab that list. We're now moving to citizen concerns. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Oh, yeah, I guess. Um, okay. So we have, uh, I have, it looks like nine people that have written down that they would like to speak. Uh, and these are all related to citizens' concerns. Uh, remember, citizens' concerns is a time on the agenda to speak about things that are not on our agenda. So uh, this is not an official agenda item. And uh, I'm going to ask that you limit your comments to two minutes. And I would also, I, I understand, but, well, Jeff, if there's really something unique that you need to add in there, you know, we're, we're going to be lenient. But I, I would like to remind folks that, what's that, Jessica? First of all, that's insulting to say that it has to be unique. And second of all, it's thin protocol, but it's three minutes. Uh, okay, it's so, all right, so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get at the gavel, but one of the things is that we normally allow 10 minutes for citizen concerns. Um, and I think part of what I, I will repeat is that um, repeating the same comments several times once we've heard it once we appreciate that comment we will definitely be listening and absorbing it to hear the same comments 20 times is not going to have a different impact on this council so uh, i want everybody to have an opportunity to make their comments but we also have 20 more items on our agenda and so that's why we ask you to limit it to two minutes but we've always been flexible and uh so um, with that, uh, Pan Reich, you're first on my list. Thank you. Well, you won't have heard anything I've said so far. <laughs> okay. Sure you May I make sure you state your name, please? Uh, Pan, J. Pan Reich, R E I C H. Um, my use of first name is not meant as disrespect, but rather my affection for our small village culture. Okay. Uh, YSPD Chief Brian has initiated many positive changes and has been engaged and approachable to our villagers. And I recognize and appreciate this tremendously. But I am beyond disappointed with his handling of Officer Dave Meister's disciplinary uh, situation. We've all heard what happened during the two March traffic stops. Brian charges that Dave's actions caused a risk of safety to the village. But this seems inaccurate since Dave prevented both from driving further by taking one driver's keys and towing the other's car, thus ensuring safety for all. Many officers, many officers <laughs> in the past have exercised this sort of discretion, and I understand that includes Brian, and I know the circumstance, but Chief Brian has decided now to suspend Dave without pay, demote him from his recent supervising corporal promotion, prevent him from training future new officers, and he's the guy that needs to do that, and place him on probation for 12 months. The most experienced officer in the department, mm -hmm. probation for 12 months is a slap in the face. Um, and he can be fired for a single uh, additional infraction. This is not a progressive disciplinary process. And I find this draconian punishment to be an overreaction to the circumstances unfair when considering other officers' offenses and seems nefariously designed to either solicit Dave's resignation or to set him up to be fired in the near future. If Brian doesn't wish his officers to show this sort of leniency, and that's his authority to do, why didn't he counsel Dave during the two weeks before the second occurrence? YSPD has a revolving door of inexperienced, out-of-town officers too many who seem to have a serious us versus them demeanor and we struggle to retain experienced officers who actually give a damn about us such as dave dennis jeff beam and yes brian too when he's on the street 
Dave is exactly what we need as both an officer, a supervisor, and a trainer of new officers. His commitment to serving our community is so deep that he actually volunteers his time as an EMT and firefighter and for Omaha Township Rescue. But even this is now being threatened. MTFR training is always on Tuesday evenings, and Dave always seems to get scheduled on Tuesday evening to work then. And I understand Dave is now being threatened with additional punishment for attending a CPR training at MTFR between PD calls. Chief John Grody encouraged and supported Dave's participation as an MTFR volunteer, as this cross-training and service is a huge win-win for both departments and thus for our community. Is this punishment-centered management style, which is only effective for creating a culture of fear, being practiced behind the scenes at RPD regularly, or has this been used exclusively for Dave? Council members and Patty, I urge you to examine this closer. There is so much going on behind the scenes. And do what is ethical and best for our village. Please, please resist digging in your heels to reflexively support those you work closely with. Um, there are too many inconsistencies and minutes. unanswered questions. If we lose Dave, we'll not get him back, and that loss will be a sad, sad tragedy of our own making. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Right, I'm also going to... Okay. We're going to have to not do the applause, all right? Or, again, we're just going to... This is going to take way too long. So um, uh, I've got Liz Porter next. Liz Porter. After our New Year's Eve debacle, it was clear that what this community wanted was community-friendly policing. As far as I can tell, that is what we still want, and we find it exemplified in Dave Meister. I've had two experiences with Dave, one as a co-participant in an NV nonviolent communication course, and two as the beneficiary of his response as a police officer when I had called due to a frightening event outside of my home. In both instances, I was impressed by him. My letter in your packet speaks to this. My question is this, how does the police department define community policing? I understand that Chief Carlson wants his officers to have discretion in their actions, but how is this defined? For instance, I believe that the chief does not want mayor's court referrals to be mandated by the justice system task force or village policy because he wants his officers to be able to use their discretionary judgment in how they refer cases. Yet it seems that Officer Meister is being disciplined for judiciously using exactly that tool. How are the officers trained in using their discretion? How clear are the guidelines? If the guidelines are not clear or are capriciously or vindictively implemented, then the door is wide open for individuals within the force to be unfairly singled out for discipline when they have impl implemented informed discretion in the best way that they understand the rules. From what I understand in Officer Meister's case, it seems that his actions are in exact alignment with the de-escalating humane wishes of the community, hearkening back to the, the time when James McKee was chief. The village benefits from having an officer who is engaged in and committed to the community, while the police department may find it to be a problem. This, um, the following may or may, this may or may not be uh, relevant, but it is my concern based on my experience. As a retired um, RN, I have witnessed several healthcare institutions which covertly did not wish to have employees who worked where they lived. Those institutions lost a great deal of character as a result of local employees being harassed out of their jobs. And you're at two minutes. Locals anywhere tend to be passionate. They might be whistleblowers. Boundaries may be more difficult to clarify between private and professional lives. I wish to strongly state my belief that the potential complications for the organizations should be seen as strengths to be worked with and not as detriments to the organization. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Okay, Gail. My name is Gail Pettigrew. I moved here to Yellow Springs about six years ago. 
partly because it reminded me of small town I grew up in Minnesota. The town I grew up in was a one street light town. We had two police officers and it was community policing like what it sounds like this village wanted. To this day I remember their names as Jug and Ole. Not officer so and so, it was Jug and Ole. And like that gentleman said, that's the way I look at Dave Meister. I look at him as Dave, community officer. I spent my time in the Air Force, and one of the things that I noticed in the Air Force compared to the Army was the disciplinary actions that were taken. The Army, if a, somebody did some minor violation, they had a strike pulled, which resulted in a less pay, which put a burden on the family for simple, simple violation. In the Air Force, the Air Force's way of dealing with someone, if it was a minor violation, not a crime, but a minor violation, you got a letter of counseling, which was exactly that, counseling. For a second offense, you got a letter of reprimand, which was pretty much a slap on the back of the hand. Third violation, you got an Article 15, which then would result in maybe losing a stripe in money. From what I've seen with Officer Meister, he clearly has not been in a whole lot of trouble here. He was up for police chief. If he had been in trouble in the past, surely he wouldn't have been up for police chief. So from what I'm seeing that he's done, I think this is so heavy handed to I'm take sorry, money away minutes. and drop him in pay for, for something simple like this. Why wasn't he sat down in council first? if there was a problem. But to be honest, I don't even see there was a problem. He was doing community policing, which is what this community asked for. And to me, you know, we just had that debacle with New Year's where everybody was heavy handed and nationwide people are coming down on police officers for their heavy handedness. We've got an officer that's being lean at and he's being punished for it and outrageously punished. And I think this council needs to stand up and do something about it. All right, thanks, Gail. Uh, Sharon, I've got you next. Well, I don't have anything written out, I mean, and everybody has been up here. I agree with everything they said. Um, I think David uh, is a good policeman for here because he lives here. Somebody that lives here, whose children go to school here, who has neighbors here, is not going to bully people. And I, uh, if we're talking about um, discretionary uh, policing, the, I know that there's a lot of incidents just up where I live. They're, they're gone this year. But for about three years, there was a family living next door to me that partied night after night after night after night. And I would call the police. And the police would come, and they would go, and they would talk to them. And the police, the squad car taillights would be going down the street, and they'd just resume. They treated the police with absolute, absolute contempt. And nobody did anything about them. And one night, there was a sheriff's car out there. There were two Yellow Springs squad cars out there. There were officers everywhere. And there's never anything in the paper about it. Why, why, uh, if, if the things are, are listed in the, in the police report is all that happened, we don't need that many police. I, I think there's just not any transparency. These people, we have, we have given them power. And who, it's just not healthy for them to be able to remain opaque. When they, we have given them power over our citizens and the community should have transparency as to what they're doing. Okay, thanks Sharon. Okay, Alisa.
Hi, I'm Elisa Meyer. I've witnessed bullying done by the YSPD against citizens multiple times, and I've witnessed bullying from officer to officer within the YSPD. And it's fairly written out and clear in this case that there's been bullying once again, officer to officer. And if they're willing to bully officers, their, their fellow officers, then what do you think that they're willing to do to citizens? That's all. Thanks, Elisa. Who is this? Oh, Uta. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Couldn't read your writing, sorry. That's okay. I'm not a doctor, though. Yeah, <laughs> mine's worse. <laughs> Hello. My name is Uta Schenk, and I think some of you know me. As you know, my son was killed in this village a number of years ago. I'm here, though, to talk about community policing and how things like this can be prevented in the future. One of the things I th want to say is people like Dave Meister make young people and people who need help, who are, say, mentally ill, as my son was, and who perhaps are intoxicated or high, on what are some of the ways that we can do better when that person is arrested? When that person is in a crisis, I know we've been working on it, and I've been very, very glad to see some of the steps that we've made in years, in those years following. And the community has been open to that change, and I think it's a work in progress, and I appreciate it very much. I decided to continue to live here. Now, our grandson, who is Paul's son, has had problems. He never got through or worked through his father's death. He was there when it happened. And he's been using alcohol and who knows what. He was arrested not too long ago. He's spent a year and a half so far in maximum security prison. He has, he got two to six years. Now, we wished he had had some alcohol treatment, anger management, and other things. But it's too bad these prisons do not have that. There's no money for it. So when he comes out, if he comes out in one piece, which time, I don't know, we don't know, will he better be a person when he comes back to us? Will I be alive? I have cancer. I don't know. We're, we're not very happy right now, and we would like this village to know that there are people hurting here because of it. Our grandson seems to be doing okay. He's hoping for an early out, but it's difficult, isn't it? So if we have police, okay, policing, we have community policing, we need to look, figure out how to help our young people who've had violent things happen in their lives, Ms. Bates. You know I've talked to you about it. And I'm very, very sad about what's happened in our lives now. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. And I think it's Officer Meister and people like that will make young people go to them and trust them and say, what can we do? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Carlos? Officer. Dave Meister is being disciplined way out of proportion, including last chance probation, even that sounds bad, right? For something that is being done all the time, or is just a minor discretionary, discretionary error, or perhaps it could be the case that this is an act of service, something generous that he did, risking even his own situation to help someone and to be useful to the community. Uh, he should be, he should, maybe he should be commended for what he did, not punished. Um, for the life of me, I can't understand what is going on here. Um, if Kafka the writer were living among us, he would have a field day, what is going on here. He, would have, he could write a whole book about this. Um, that's, that's all I, I, I shall urge counsel to, if nobody else is stepping in, I hope counsel takes a look at this directly and does something about it. 
Thanks, Carlos. <laughs> Jessica. Jessica Thomas. Um, first of all, Brian, I want you to remember that the people sitting in this room are among the people who elected you to Village Council. You may get tired of hearing the same thing repeated, but it is your duty to listen and serve this community. As many other folks have stated, Dave Meister exemplifies what we believe community policing should look like. To that effect, we should be working to hire more people who work with our community the way that Dave does. After emailing council, which will, I will not read because I assume that it has been entered into the minutes, it is clear that the degree of separation between council and the PD does not allow for council to intervene. That said, you do have a justice system task force that is set up to make suggestions to council regarding our police force. I suggest that justice system task force work closely with Patty and the chief to write a best practice protocol based on the types of things that Dave does with this community. This will make sure the officers are not doling out tickets when they could make sure that people are safely arriving home. Let me remind you that it was not too long ago that a woman, a long-term resident, was pulled from her car while sitting in it with the keys on the passenger seat waiting for a ride home. That is the opposite of what we want here. And if it is not clear to you, let me be clear. That is not the type of policing we want in Yellow Springs. And I, I, that's really all I have to say, but I think that this is just a disgusting display of abuse of power, yes. and yes. We're, we're tired of it. Okay. Thanks, Jessica. Matt Raska. Matt Raska. This, this particular council meeting reminds me of a meeting about a year and a half ago that we had in the basketball court where everyone said, their particular concerns, and you guys dutifully listened, and, and then nothing happened. And you spent $100,000 on lawyers that is gonna be being paid off for the next five years. It's in the budget, by the way, in case anyone is interested. Um, and then you pick someone that didn't change anything about the department, never fixed anything that led up to New Year's Eve, and then we're here now, we're here now. It's, it's, it's never been fixed. The wound is still open. The problem is still there. The car is still broken. And it is your yeah. fault, Brian. Remember, last year and a half, I told you, we would remember. They remember. That is all. Thanks, Matt. OK, so uh, I'm going to bring it back to council. And uh, maybe we all have some comments. Lisa, do you have anything that you want to? Um. As I come up to speed with this issue, the, th the thing that I'm thinking about the most is, is the future. And because I'm fe I feel the pain in the community and, and I feel the pain personally. I mean, this is a really, really difficult situation. And um, it, it is true that there, is, uh, there are certain things, actions that the council do and that uh, Patty Bates does, we each have our roles and responsibilities. But it, it's absolutely imperative that we, we listen to your input. And I'm grateful for the outpouring of, of, of information from everyone, the people that have reached out to talk to us, who've sent us emails. We are taking this in. Um, and I mean, personally, I'm trying to understand how are we going to end up um, resolving this issue in a way that preserves the best possible relationships that we can have between community policing, the community, trust your trust in the police force, trust in us, how can we advocate in that role? And I, I'm still trying to find my way through it. So, Gail, we can't have interruptions. Well, if we have time, then I'll maybe bring you back up. Yeah. Okay? Thank, but thank you know. Thank you. I I appreciate the the perspectives. Kevin. 
Thank you all for being here. Uh, we appreciate you coming. Um, you know, having an active citizenry is, is key um, to our success uh, as council and as, um, as a village. What troubles me is, quite honestly, and, and, and I feel like I'm taking off my council hat, hat right now. I'm just a regular citizen. Um, I, I work at Antioch College. I am a director of IT. I manage and lead people. Um, so, but what troubles me, quite honestly, is why I or anyone else in the village knows what we know about an internal private disciplinary issue. That, that first of all, is troubling. Why are we even talking about this? Why is what piece of information uh, has been made public has been made public? It is my opinion that if a reasonable person who A, loves Dave Meister as we all do, and B, knew the entire story, it is my opinion that you still would have written the letter, you still would have said all the great things about Dave Meister because they're true. And if you knew the entire story, your letter would have ended with, good job, Chief Carlson, for how you handled the discipline, the discipline of Dave Meister. This is, this is my opinion if you know the whole story. This is, this is, this is all there is. So, so because there is, and I know this sounds like political speak or, or lawyer speak, I think I would have been a good lawyer. Um, you know, th there is an ongoing investigation and, and the, the unfortunate thing is the folks who know and are obligated to hold um, the, the facts until the process has taken its course. And that's the one key thing, is that we need to respect the process. We all know that. We all know we need to respect the process. Um, and, that's, and that's fine. I, and I appreciate that. Transparency. Why don't we know? The question, my first question was, why do we know anything if we don't know everything? Um, no, that's, there, there, so it is my opinion that knowing the entire story, I think what one would say, good job, Chief Carlson, in how you handle it. And, and, and again, and I, and I know, well, I, I won't get into to any potential ramifications. I, as a, as a citizen, I'm speaking my opinion. Um, not, not yet. I, I, I would like council members to be able to make statements. Uh, well, so we just spent 25 minutes hearing from citizens. I think it's important we hear from council. And I'm being patient. I'm being respectful. All right. Okay. Well, he's a council member. All right, Judy. Okay. Um, well, um, yeah, I, I want to say I'm not, I'm not going to speak specifically to the situation because we're, there's an investigation going on, potential litigation, you know, t to protect the village. Uh, we need to do, I need to do that. But I do think this situation has raised some very clear, uh, some clarity. I uh, guess I already knew this, but that I wanted to just share. Um, one, uh, trust is a foundation of safety-focused policing. Trust of the officers who are our public servants, uh, as I said, is the center of that. And so, it's very important that we see uh, that our that if a police officer is seen as a resource, as a helper, uh, when a person is trouble is in trouble. I mean, that is the kind of police officers that we want. Um, also. Trust comes through the relationships that people have, the knowing and being known by the community. And so, you know, some of the strengths that 
uh, Officer Meister has is the fact that he, is, he has lived here a long time and he is known, he's involved in the community, and he, he, and he knows us. And I think that um, those deeper relationships makes the enforcement of laws in a compassionate and safety-centered way more complex. It actually makes it more complex when you actually know the people that you are, you know, interacting with. Um, Com yeah, compassionate safety center policing requires, the thing I think we really need to do in part to move forward is that we actually need to have a conversation about what does that actually look like in these very specific circumstances where there is a safety concern, you know. Drinking and driving is a serious safety concern. What, is, what does it look like to have a compassionate uh, intervention there? And I don't feel like we've had that conversation and that's central. I mean, I think it's central to the community and it's central to our police department. I'm sure they've been having some of these conversations, but so that, so that uh, the department is working holistically. One person's not doing something very different than the other person. We want, we want people to be thinking together. And then in the particular circumstances, circumstances, discretion is going to be part of the decision making that that person makes, but they'll have this background of discussion. I mean, I'm a nurse. When we went, had our nursing meetings, you know, we have, you know, a problem we run into. We would discuss it as a group. We'd hear from people, um, you know, this is how I've handled that. You know, this is um, what I would suggest you do. And, you know, it's, and then that conversation, no, no clear-cut answers in particular situations, you get into that particular situation and you've got that, that reservoir of sort of wisdom that you've, and, and, and sort of having thought through. And so I, I feel like we need to see that more of that is going to be very important um, as we move forward. And the final thing I want to say is, you know, for our little community, you know, we have, uh, uh, Corporal Meister that a lot of people appreciate a lot and really care about and have, you know, had really good service by him. And we've got a chief who is still relatively new, finding his footing. A lot of people have been very positively impacted by his, his efforts as well. So I feel like to move forward, the kind of, um, we, we need to be able to keep as uh, our communication with one another as open and honest as possible. Name calling never helps that. Expect, you know, in, you know, deciding, you know, the worst that, the worst about that person, that doesn't help us move forward at all. Um, some of the discourse on Facebook, and I know Facebook can have its positive side. People request documents, you get to see them, you get better informed. But there's a lot of name calling uh, and just really ugly stuff. And I just encourage our community not to participate or to, you know, get, you know, there's a lot of fear mongering, you know, expecting the worst in one another. And it just, in terms of democratic societies, democratic institutions, that kind of discourse is corrosive. I mean, we want democracy, we want government of, for, and by the people. Well, you know, we have to hold ourselves to some higher standards. Uh, personal criticism never, it always has a negative impact on that. Uh, you know, debating and disagreeing about ideas, that's fine. But when you start attacking people, you know, as human beings, their decency as human beings, that always is going to have a very negative impact on that kind of discourse that we need to have because our policing in our country needs major change. Mm -hmm. our, our council is very committed to that. Our, I believe our chief of police is very committed to that. I believe David Meister is very committed to that. And, we, and we've got to be able to talk to each other and have some kind of level of um, just respect. And so I just urge us to keep that in mind uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Okay. Marian? Um, We're five of us sitting up here, so um, I don't find it difficult to, uh, for the most part, to hear criticism. But when someone says nothing has changed, you know, for people, I mean, we, first of all, we all put in a whole lot of time beyond what we're paid for, but staff 
it, it's the staff that I'm concerned about. A year and a half ago, I was in that, uh, right in the middle of that um, blow up. So I have personally, and, and a whole lot of other people that were at the New, Year Eve, New Year's Eve thing, personally experienced the kind of thing that we don't want to experience. And so. You were arrested? No, I wasn't arrested. But, no, okay. I did not. The, this, this is a very, very difficult situation we have here. Everyone loves David Meister. This is not about David Meister as a wonderful person, as a committed community member, as a police officer committed to community policing in the best sense of the word. This is not what this is about. Now we. What, this, uh, let, let me finish. I, I sat here and I really listened to what everyone said. First of all, can, can you, and this is a rhetorical question, can you imagine that you do not have a whole lot of the information and that a lot of the information you have is wrong? And I will tell you that there are two people who have been after this village two people who have been making so many public records requests that we almost have to hire a staff person to do what they're asking and now they're taking us to court about it. And these people do not live in Yellow Springs. They used to. They do not live here anymore and I really question their motivation. And some of the, in, the initial information that started coming out was coming out about these two people. And here is what they have done. We have a chief of police now who everyone loved a year ago. Oh, no, everyone didn't love him. Well, that's what we heard then. If, if, this, if this kind of thing continues to happen, if every time something happens, we get this kind of thing that gets blown up on social media, we will not have this chief of police. And, and I, I have some understanding of what is happening. And, you know, we are in the process and we are trying to change things. And do things go smoothly? No, they don't. They don't. But, and I don't think it is appropriate to assume that a personnel issue is transparent. That is not how these things are done. And we don't, I don't think we really want a police department where every, where all the information gets out there. That, that, that just meant, I'm just finishing, and I'm about ready to, to, I just do not think, this is not something that the group, that the community makes the decision on, well, we like this officer, so uh, this shouldn't happen. We don't like this officer, so, I mean, uh, we would just disband our police department and get the county to, and, you know, there are some people that want that, maybe that's all that. Um, so I'm just going to say a few things uh, because, as I mentioned before, uh, repeating the same comments once we've heard it, I think we all are listening, we're all rational, we're all emotional as well. Um, everyone probably saw I made a public statement um, and I highlighted two things. One that was very important is that Dave Meister is an integral part of our police team. And every council member believes that, Patty believes that, Chief Carlson believes that. Related to that, everything that we have been working on, especially since the New Year's Eve debacle, but even before that, has been about, well, I, I use local or village policing and really delivering on what we understand Yellow Springs residents expect and it's what we want too. So, there's, there's no lip service there. I mean, everything we've been doing is to build this local mentality and as much, as much as possible have officers that live here and incentivize that and we've talked about those things. The other point that I made was that, and, and it's been brought up, is that there's a significant amount of misinformation that's led to misunderstanding and uh, a lot of that is more purposeful disinformation. And it's unfortunate that that's happening because if you look at all the work we've done, I mean, you would, we would have to be mentally ill 
if we spent this much time working on guidelines for village policing, having a justice system task force, collaborating with the community, and as Marianne said, I, I mean, it's ridiculous to say that nothing has changed. So much has changed in a year and a half. And certainly, change is hard, change is slow. We are against a national phenomena where we have officers that are trained terribly, and we are trying to retrain them in Yellow Springs, and that is why we have Florence. This is why we have 40-hour crisis intervention team training required for all our officers. This is why the entire village is gonna be doing implicit bias training next month. And the list goes on. We have invested a lot of time and money as a village, as a council, as a community in this, and it doesn't make any sense that we would be going after somebody like David Meister and trying to get him off the force. It's quite the opposite. We're doing everything we can to rehabilitate this situation and make sure that this all works. So it is a little bit disturbing, but as Marianne said, we're elected officials. This is what we expect. We get yelled at, everything's our fault. Maybe you're doing it, but what about the police? Okay, well, and so. You're doing your best, but what about them? Okay, so, uh, and, and so I think that's a fair question. Patty asked to say something, so I'm gonna let her. I, I just want to address two what I'm going to call factual issues that I can address. The first one is, Pan, you said that Dave had been suspended without pay, and that is not correct. Dave has worked the entire time. He has not been suspended without pay. In fact, I believe he's on duty tonight. That's not what I meant. I meant he, that's part of the proposed punishment. Oh, you meant as a suspension. Okay. Okay. Because you, you used it kind of in the past tense, and I was like, that's not, yeah, okay. I just want to be clear that he is still working. He's not on leave or anything. And the other, the, someone asked, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was that asked, um, but why can't we be, why can't we tell you all the facts right now? Someone asked that question. I, as the village manager, the council as council people and all of my employees are technically um, prohibited from discussing the, the process publicly until it is complete, okay? The manual does not allow me as the village manager to tell you anything about disciplinary actions while they are ongoing, okay? Once a disciplinary action becomes complete, and it is finalized, if you want to use that word, then it becomes a public record. Then you can ask me questions and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Right now I can't do that because this is an ongoing matter. So when you ask us to be transparent, understand that, as Kevin said, we need to respect the process. And the process, unfortunately, in the public arena is time consuming and lengthy, but the reason it is is because it makes sure that employees are allowed due process. There are 10 points of due process if you read administrative law. And I have to afford every single one of those to any employee who is undergoing a disciplinary process. And it takes time. And the whole time I have to sit here and keep my mouth shut about what's going on because that's just the way it is. Okay, and so it's not that I don't want to share information with you, it's that I am constrained from doing so until the process is complete. And it's not just the way it is in Yellow Springs. That's correct. That's, that is the letter of the law. Um, so we have been at this for 45 minutes. Um, I would like to wrap this discussion up, but I do want to, first of all, Elisa, to your question, just briefly say, I think everybody knows, including our village team, that council has gotten very involved in policing and we are not backing off of that. And so we are committed to making sure that we deliver on the guidelines for village policing. So we are listening, we are paying attention, we are informed when these things happen. And so we are, we are in that mix and we are not gonna back off of that. I mean, I have been focused on policing issues for almost five years now since I've been on council. And, and this is something that 
I mean, it's an ongoing issue uh, throughout the nation, and unfortunately, even our village, you know, we can't get away from that. But I just want to say that we will continue with our commitment to be involved in a way that councils would not normally be involved in this. And so you should keep talking to us, and by no means my trying to cap our discussion or at least, you know, limit it to some degree, that is not intending to say that I don't want to hear from everybody. You can call us, you can email us, but we would not be able to do any other village business if we only talked about this. And we've got so many things around affordability that we've got to think about. Um, but then I did want to, you had a question, and if it's relevant and you still want to ask it, I'll, I'll allow that too. Ryan, I'll ask you, where did you make your public statement? Because uh, it was in the paper, and, um, and, and I also, it was on the Village of Yellow Springs Facebook page and on my Facebook page for okay. council. Yes, I, I applaud you all to be under fire like this and to speak so honestly. And I, I understand that there is a process and we need to respect it. Do you have any idea of a timeline when we'll get some of the facts that you're seeking? Chris. Chris, I think Chris? that one's yours. <laughs> Teed up for you. Donna, and, you and as Chris is getting up here, I do want to just along those lines, we are pushing the boundaries in this case, but we feel like it's important to, to say what we can say. Um, you know, and it's been alluded to that Officer uh, Corporal Meister is uh, represented by counsel, uh, by legal counsel, uh, and there is a dialogue that is going on with his representative. Uh, meanwhile, there's a process that has to be followed by the handbook, and um, while those discussions are going on, um, it's hard to say. Um, and I would say some, somewhere in the next 21 to maybe 30 days, there'll be some type of, I think, resolution. Um, but I, I just don't know yet. But I can assure you that we are following the processes that are required by the handbook. And, uh, and that's kind of the key here. Okay. Thanks. And, and, and I w if I could add one other thing. Yes. I don't think that anyone is served well by a rush to process this. Uh, and that the fact that there's a deliberate effort to make sure that everything's being taken into consideration and understanding that this is not a prejudged situation. The mere fact that there's been a recommendation of discipline, as you've indicated, you've talked about proposed. Proposed means not final. So there is discretion to be exercised. An officer or a corporal meister will have an opportunity to present information uh, that will presumably mitigate the situation. So have an opportunity to do that. And he's got a very, very good lawyer representing him. So the process will be one thing for sure, and I will tell you that it will be fair. Okay. Um, all right, Patty wanted to say something quickly, and then I'll give Judith the final comment. I, I just want to say, and, and I said this to counsel as well, if you like to discipline people, you shouldn't have the power to discipline people. I don't like to discipline people. I, I lose sleep over disciplining people. It's the worst part of my job. I can guarantee you that Chief Carlson is losing sleep. It, he is not enjoying this process. Don't think that any of us undertake this type of, of process lightly, because we don't. I've never enjoyed it. I will never enjoy it. it. And again, if you do enjoy it, you shouldn't have the power to do it. And that's just the way it is. Neither one of us enjoys it. Council doesn't enjoy it. So. OK. Um, well, I was just going to say, the organizational chart for village government uh, is that at the top are the citizens, and we we work for you, and then you know, Patty works for us, and and the people who work under her. Um, your your the conversation that this situation has evoked, I think, is very very important, not not only for Corporal Meister, um, but for the whole community, for the whole police department. Um, I think you know getting clearer about what our village wants in our policing and thinking about, well, how do we do that? It's not so simple. It's not black and white. And so anyway, I think this, this, the discourse that's coming, come out of this can, can help really move us forward. So that's 
I'm always looking for how do we make the, the best out of the, out of any kind of difficult circumstance. So I'm encouraged All right. by that. So on staff. That's all I'm saying. You got a dirty cop on there. She's caused us problems. She's a problematic cop. She's the one complaining against my state. So Okay, so I want that I think is the kind of comment that is very unhelpful. And and when That's true. and having a kind of discourse where where real issues rise to the top is important. But having, as Judith said, name calling, which has happened so much on, on Facebook, and, and intentional, I think sometimes misinformation, really winds things down and polarizes in a way that I think is well, very important. OK, well. <laughs> Very uh, limited information. Okay, well, I. I recognize in my post uh, that I don't know probably important things that you guys know. Okay, I recognize that. I have also said that these two people mentioned who are linked to an online publication, out of all our that publication. I have called them sensationalist mad right. Yeah. And I am right. like we're being a lot of people. However, Kevin is asking me to trust the system, trust the process. And as a person who has worked in the corporate world as an employee for many years, when you have a situation between employee and boss, if you trust the system for too long, you are dead. At the end of the system, well, okay. So and, and so let me just wrap things up to say. The point about the you know, two out-of-towners that are sensationalizing was just to point out where the misinformation, disinformation came from. So, so I, I'm just saying that's, what it was, that's why it was stated. The second thing you've heard all council members say is we get it, all right? This is why we've spent all this time. I'd like to add one thing here that I found a little bit disturbing today. And yet the police chief today went to this villager and asked why they turned against him. I find that a little bit shocking. Well, I, I don't know about that. And so again, I don't want to get into, okay, well, now we're getting into hearsay and we are going to wrap this conversation up. Um, if we have a meeting on July 16th, if you feel that there is still issues to be talked about, we will leave plenty of time for citizens' concerns. Um, I appreciate what Carlos said about how you can't trust the system forever, but this is not forever, all right? This process just started, things were leaked, we are handling it. And we appreciate that you are bringing your concerns to our attention. We are addressing that because we are your elected officials. And, so we and, need to and uh, apropos to that, um, this uh, system, our, this electoral system, is set up so that every two years, three council seats are up for election. Three out of five, that's the majority. It's set up that way, I think, so if you don't like what council's doing, you can kick the bums out and uh, run your site, you know, get your own site. So in a year, three people will be up and, you know, you can start, you don't think we're doing a good job? Start working on. Okay, so start so, making signs. I, <laughs> Pan, uh, please quickly. We really have 20 more items we have to get to. I'm just sorry. 20 seconds. I know four of you very, very well, and I know I believe in my heart four of you have the village's heart in your best interest. I believe that. I think you do too. I voted for you, but I don't know you very well. <laughs> Kevin, are you aware that that uh, then Officer Brian? Did the exact same thing in 2012 to answer the question, but the answer is no. So I'm only suggesting that, yes, I believe we all know things we don't as y'all. But please keep your minds open. There are things you don't know. 
There are things you don't know, and I am suggesting and pleading with you to find information from sources other than Naomi and, and Brian. Yes. Please, please dig a little deeper. I have My position as a paramedic, I know most of the officers, and my position with Antioch, mm -hmm. and I work and I love you. Oh, I love you too, Pam. <laughs> Okay, and I will say, I think Chris needs I, to, to sort of respond. I, I just said that's what the hearing process is for. Is for right, but. If, if this goes to the court, I'm going to be spending money that the money is spent. Well, we, we don't want to do that either. Um, I will say this is a council that does a lot of digging, asks a lot of questions, and you'd be amazed at the amount of time we've spent on this, just like any other issue. So I appreciate that, though. Thank you for the comments and input. And again, if you have anything else you didn't get a chance to say tonight, email us, call us, stop us on the street, and come to our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we do have to keep the door open, so if you're going to continue conversations, just please go downstairs. And you're welcome to stay for the rest of the That's true. The yeah. Much, much more exciting oh, things oh, to oh, talk oh, about. I love that. All right. And so uh, would council like to take a short break? Are you ready to go? Move on? Good? What's that? Well, she's up, so I think we should. We'll see. Do we need to? Now I don't mind. Yeah, just. Yeah, we should. Just let me. We'll, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Well, they got your name. Thank you for coming. We might want to take some things off. What are we doing? No, we, we don't know yet. Are we going to press on like the nails so we're not here until midnight? <laughs> okay. I, I, good all right, you, so we're good. So we're on to old business then. Okay. Um, so our first order of old business is the utility affordability discussion. Lisa. Okay. Um, we're making progress with this. There's something in the packet. Um, we've developed a draft set of guidelines and implementation steps for the Roundup program, and uh, we're bringing it to council for discussion and input. Uh, the list of contributors were Patty, uh, Tim Baum, who is a citizen and also a member of HRC, um, Colleen, uh, me, Kevin, and Kat Walter. And uh, we've talked about this before, but we're envisioning the program as an opt-in program where citizens can select to round up to the nearest dollar. So that means the maximum that they're opting in for could be like 99 cents. Um, but they also have the option to write in an additional amount towards the program should they wish. This is something that we've been approached by a number of citizens as something that they would want to do. So imagine if you have your bill and you check out, you're opted in, but you want to just give like an extra $5, you would just write that. Or $10, $10 or $20. Or, or, but I mean, we've had people in the community say, oh yeah, we would really like to give more money to help this program. So um, the way we envision it working, this is the first time we've talked about process uh, with this group. So the applications to participate in the Roundup program would be submitted to the utility office, and it would need to come in by the 21st of the month in order to have the processing done. The person would have to uh, apply in person with proof of identity, and they could apply for the uh, Roundup program uh, once a year. One of the things about Roundup programs is that the village utility office doesn't make the decision about whether an individual qualifies for the Roundup program or not. So the, the, we set criteria, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute, but the qualifications are determined by a nonprofit partner. So um, the, the working uh, qualifications that we're talking about right now is that to uh, qualify for the Roundup program, the household would have to be at risk for shutoff. Um, the household would be at 80% of area median income. And there's that little table on there. That's the table that we've seen before related to housing. So you'll see that, that the light colored text were you know, the higher income areas. So 80% of AMI would be, for example, a one person household 
um, making $35,650 a year, and then it would go down from there. Um, other requirements is that um, the Roundup covers the amount not to exceed $200 required to prevent shutoff. And one of the things that we, we talked about um, was this, the challenge that if the Roundup program just helps you to prevent getting shut off, you still could go into a negative cycle mm -hmm. that could affect you financially because right away you're already, you're not shut off, but your next bill is coming and your next, and how do you just not go, still go into that down, downward spiral, just being helped that one time by the Roundup program. Mm -hmm. So we're also recommending that there's a requirement that you go on a payment program that the, the, the village utility office will set up that payment program so that they won't, people won't get into this month over month snowballing that has the most negative effect on the people with the least ability to pay their full utility bill every month. That's who we're trying to help. And then third, that the village is going to provide information about other assistance programs and will actively assist citizens to figure out how to navigate other services. So this changes somewhat the interactional role of the utility office more towards a, a group of people that are helping to connect people with services and, and to problem solve and make sure that we're proactively helping people get set up so that they're just not falling further and further behind. So that's the proposal. Um, you know me and my action plans. So on the second side of this, and we don't have to get into the weeds, but um, we, we, we did sort of a, a divide and conquer approach where um, Patty or Patty and Colleen took certain steps, Kevin took certain steps, Tim, you know, we just, we kind of divided up the work related to decisions that have to be made about the accounting system. Um, for example, um, with some uh, municipalities that do this, um, the money that's in the fund for the Roundup program is actually transferred over to the to another entity and then paid back. So it like gets, you know, in terms of accounting, it, it gets like credited out and debited back and you know, and I mean that's up to Colleen to decide as far as accounting. But it, there's still decisions that need to be made, new accounts to be set up, the bill needs to be set up differently. Um, we did, in terms of capacity building, we did talk about uh, Miller Fellow. That came up in our last council meeting with some concerns about Miller Fellow management, and I'll defer that point because Patty, ha uh, we have talked a little bit more about that and have some ideas. The Miller Fellow idea is not entirely off the, f off the table, I'll just say that. Um, we are still identifying a nonprofit partner. We had thought that um, Community Solutions would be able to serve as our nonprofit partner, but they do not have the capacity. The role of the nonprofit partner is simply, and I don't mean, you know, I don't mean to denigrate it, it's really important. Their role is to decide if a person or a household qualifies or doesn't. The village doesn't make that decision. The uh, PADI, the utility office, doesn't make that decision. So the application comes in and then it goes to a neutral nonprofit partner who decides yes or no, the person qualifies based on the criteria, and then it comes back. So that's the role of the nonprofit partner. Um, the guidelines, you have them in draft. Uh, Kevin's working on mocking up an application. And then there's a whole bunch of communication planning stuff that would have to go with this and the roll up. Um, at the very bottom, it points out that the Roundup program is only one action to promote utility affordability and address some of the root causes of high utility bills, things like bad insulation, things like old toilets that have a billion gallons in the tank, um, things that people don't know how to insulate, people, you know, even in rentals, um, people don't know how or they don't have the money to do it. So that's the second phase. Once we get the Roundup program rolling, um, is to work on education programs, take action to help people to, to promote affordability for their utilities, and there's also a PBL um, being considered for the schools. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'd like your input on the, on the guidelines and on the process, and because uh, we'd like to keep moving forward with this.
Well, I have some input already. I actually described this program to someone and I stated something that's not written here. So I guess I'd like to <laughs> get some input. Because well, we did this together. <laughs> I know, I was there. No, 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 it, no, 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 it, it's, it's, no, it's not bad. It's not too, it's not a departure at all. Okay. So the, there's a limit of what a person can, a, fam, a household can receive at $200 a year. Um, but when I shared with someone earlier, I did not mention the once per year. In fact, I contradicted the once per year. In other words, if there's a limit that, that my household could receive, I don't plan to apply, um, of $200 per year, perhaps my first effort is conservative and I only ask for 100. Um, no, you're shaking your head. Are you, are you, are you going? One, one time. One time. So, so if that's the case, if I only need 100, should I ask for 200? Well, it's the amount, you're not, the people aren't asking for a certain amount. They have a bill mm -hmm. and they have an amount that will prevent them from being shut off. Right, there's That's issue. not the amount. They're not asking for us to write them a check for $200. They're asking us to, to cover up to a maximum of $200 the amount of their utility bill that will prevent shut off. Right. Un understood. But I'm saying if it doesn't take all of that 200 that I, first time. I, I can... I can 99% guarantee you it will take the 200 the first time. Yeah. Okay. In rare instances, will it not take that to keep someone from getting shut off? Okay. Duly noted. I withdraw my. <laughs> I, I just had a um, suggestion. I mean, I don't know how much money this is going to engender. Um, but that was I, how we came up with the $200. We 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 have kind of done some calculations of how much money we anticipate um, Well, I guess in. what I wondered is if for people with extremely low income and even very low income, if there was enough money there, and I don't know how we would do this, but I, I wondered if there would be the op possible. I thought it would be good if we could say, you know, once per year, I don't know. I guess I was thinking, would it be possible to possibly have if the funding was there to say two times a year for some people. Oh, I see what you're people. saying. Well, I think we're going to, I'd be absolutely open to looking at that. Um, before Melissa Dodd left, she did some calculations mm -hmm. of, you know, because we don't know how many people will opt in. So we have to be conservative with the pool of money that we have. And then there is a possibility because it's a brand new program that the first year we try it, we run out of money and we don't want to have to do that, right? So we're trying to, I think the way she modeled it was if 50% of people opted in, we would have this much money. And again, if it's just an opt-in with no additional write-in, maximum of 99 cents. Right. So we, we did calculate, then we, um, the utility office also gave us information about the approximate number of people that have, are at risk of shut off, you know, and then we counted the first instances of those. So that's how we came up with the $200. So I think what I hear you suggesting is, is it possible to say for low moderate income, it's one time 200, but maybe for extremely low, it's more than one time 200? I mean, we can look at that. Yeah. Well, it, it, and I'm sitting here thinking as well, just occurred to me that we may want to make some provision for, um, you know, if we have a month where there are multiple applications maybe nobody gets 200 but everybody gets something and then are referred to other agencies or something like that right and that I'm that just, i'm sorry sorry did you finish um so i'm seeing all, i don't see where we did agree on at least acknowledging that uh we could offer these payments while the funds exist or until they're exhausted yeah that would have to be in the policy description so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, well, the cash flow seems like it. Could, yeah. I mean, it would be. Are we trying to? Are we trying to front load it a bit? I would think it would be. Yeah. I think this is a question for Colleen. She, Colleen has just come up to speed so quickly, and she stepped into this with. A, she has a lot of knowledge about the accounting principles and how to get this set up. So we're um, going to be meeting again the end of July, and she's going to come back with recommendations. Um, I have a suggestion about the nonprofit partner. Well, first, first I was thinking, well, does it need to be a nonprofit partner? 
could it be like a three people that get chosen somehow? That was my first thought. And then I thought, maybe the senior center could do this. Maybe, mm. maybe um, some, you know, it could be run through the senior center and they could have sometimes somehow three people saying, you know, who would come together and it wouldn't have to always be the same three people for a year or something. Uh, so mm -hmm. Some, you know, some free time to do this. Yeah. I, I did have a meeting set with the Community Foundation and um, with Gina Marie Cox and Lori Kuhn from the Morgan Family Foundation is going to attend as well. So mm -hmm. I think that that may work out. Uh, but if not, I think the Senior oh. Center is a That's a great idea. That yeah. is a great idea. Um, I really like the process, uh, and I wanted to comment that something <clears throat> I'd like to have considered for other requirements is that we siphon some funds to some kind of uh, energy efficiency audit. And yeah. so, I mean, I know you reference like That's that as two. being a phase two, but yeah. I'd like it to be in parallel. I'd like it to be ready to go. So. Anybody that qualifies for utility roundup, that's part of the program. Mm. And so we go in and we have somebody that does an analysis. And even if we have, don't have our education thing up to speed, there are people that do that. You know, mm. So we could just you know, add that mm -hmm. in, um, give them some really good recommendations. And then the other thing I wanted to say, it, it doesn't seem like this is the program to address the you know, affordability issues for moderate folks. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to keep that in the mix as well, right? Yeah. That we still, I mean, that, you know, people are hurting on a lot of different levels. So mm -hmm. I think you guys are right to target it where you are for this program. But I know we want to keep on thinking about other relief. Mm -hmm. so. I strongly agree. Um, the only thing that I think of about the energy audit, mm -hmm. and I, I think it would be really good to talk to members of the community. Hopefully people will show as much passion talking to us about stuff like this as some of these other more inflammatory issues, potentially inflammatory, is like, is that, you know, that would require you to let like people come into your house, you know, and, and, and check you out, like check out your windows, check out the drafts, and, you know, would that be, uh, you know, can, we probably can't make that a requirement. We're, we can require people to go on a payment plan because they have debt to the village. I, I mean, I think it's possible to, um, to line something up with maybe uh, county, state, yeah. or even home rates. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so to offer it, but I don't think that we can yeah. require we that we allow people, that then it's like if, we, if we'll put you on a roundup plan, we require that you have an energy audit of your home. I'm not yeah. sure about that. It, it, it costs money, too. And, la and landlords would be maybe, you know, because you need permission from the property owner, I guess is my point, which is not, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm yeah, right. but let, I want to talk about it more. Well, yeah, you know? think about it because ultimately if we're trying to fix a problem, right, right and not just patch it, um, right. that's the kind of thing that could you know, be yes. more significant. So I've been so trying to hold the line, like that's phase two, that's phase two, because what I am experiencing is if my ideas get too big, and it's, I mean, you know, we got all excited about that, then we don't end up getting anything moved down the field, right? Sure. But one of the things that, you know, we've talked about is, uh, um, I mean, Ken, this is something that Kat Walter was really interested in, is helping uh, young, young people, even school age or young adults, train them in, in basic skills like insulating, like changing a toilet. I mean, these are not very glamorous skills, but they're really important skills. And when you live in a community where there's a lot of older property, you know, so we're, talk, we're already starting to talk about like, how do you move? And that's what I, I alluded to here, actual doing. <laughs> that's not real clear, but what I meant by that is moving beyond just offering kind of general things to say, okay, let's help you actually insulate your windows. Right. Yeah. Cool. What about the energy board? Well, gee, the energy board. Um, I mean, Judith? They have well, the skills to be coming. Well, I think this is, that. isn't this part of the, I mean, this education? That RFP. RFP. I mean, my impression, yeah. having yeah. been chipping at this and chipping at this, is that the energy board is not interested in things like insulating windows. They're insula interested in more like the bigger 
And you, where, am I getting yeah, this Yeah, well, I think they that, could go, they could, I mean, the people in the energy board could go to someone's house and say, oh, look, this is what you need. I mean, they don't need to do it, but I mean, they have the capacity, they have the. It'd be interesting to see where people are actually in this house. We can ask. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right, good. So. So you'll ask them about that. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? All right, thanks, Lisa. Thanks. Housing Advisory Board, Mary? Yes. Miller Fellow? Sure. Because it has to be applied for by July 11th if we're going to do that. Oh, I thought that was in your manager's report. I No, it wasn't. Oh, okay. I, and so um, the um, the idea was, I, the what I heard from council at the last meeting was there was a concern about the supervision of this person yes. because in, with past Miller Fellows there has not been adequate supervision to bring mm -hmm. things to fruition. So what I talked to Colleen about um, was having Nathan Lee Hutchins, who is one of our utilities clerks, um, kind of help oversee this person um, it, because Nathan Lee has a very good understanding and perception and, and relationship with the public. And so she, when she reads something, she's going to she's going to understand how it's perceived better than just about anybody on our staff when it's related to utilities. Um, so the thought was that Nathan Lee could be the direct oversight of this person in helping them to develop the the um, publications and uh, items that we need them to. And she has the time to do that? She, uh, she does have the time. Um, she will make the time. There is always Colleen and myself as a fallback. If okay. Because just remember, the flip side of, you know, building capacity is that it takes a lot of time. I know. And then the other aspect is, you know, one of those two left a couple months after, you know, after he was trained, then he moved well, on. And, so. and the other suggestion that I have is if council does not wish to apply for a Miller Fellow because there is a, there is a small cost to a Miller Fellow. So uh, it's my understanding that there is a, a small group of Antioch students who are doing like an incubator business kind of thing that would possibly also be uh, someone that, or a group that we could use to develop these documents, publications, informational materials. That's true. The creative collaborative is yes. what you're talking about. It is what um, you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, they, they do have the creative. And so yes. that's the other possibility. The only reason I'm asking council now is because the Miller Fellow application deadline is nine days from now and I'm on vacation next week. So um, I, I, I'm fine either way um, because, as I said, there is a small cost to the Miller Fellow. Uh, because we, we do agree that we will make sure they don't lose money in taxes and OPERS and things, which we are required to pay for anybody that works here. And Patty, didn't you also mention, though, that over and above their work on the Roundup program, having a Miller Fellow type person, they have some other things that they also could do that would add value there, to yes, that office? They, they, there are other things that they could potentially do down there um, uh, over the months, depending on which schedule, because there are all different schedules you could choose them for. So there are other things that they could potentially assist with in the utilities office. Um, it, we, we would have to be, you know, make sure that they understood the confidentiality aspect and all of that because that's very important. But um, yes, Lisa, that is true. My, it, I mean, you, you, my sense is if you're willing to take this on, I mean, I'm, I'm not meaning that you would be responsible ultimately, but you know how much time people have and stuff. I, yeah, I'm not going to oppose it as long as you are, you know, thinking about it completely. So, okay. are you thinking about it completely? I would certainly <laughs> hope so at this point. Yeah. <laughs> well, <then. laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. 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 Right. What was that? Oh, uh, someone is taking some eternity. Not me. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, or, or Judy. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll add that to uh, the manager's report. So okay. we'll report Housing. back the second meeting in August. Yes. Housing Advisory Board. Okay. At our last council meeting, uh, the Housing Advisory Board submitted 
the recommended housing initiative process. And we talked about it. And my goal um, for this meeting was for council to approve what is the, what we're calling the uh, vision and policy statement. So we discussed that statement some at our last meeting. Lisa said she'd be willing to take the comments that people made and incorporate them into a somewhat edited statement, which she did. She also made a few other comments in the body of the initiative process, which I appreciate. And so I am bringing this back to council with the goal of approving the vision uh, and policy statement. And I uh, hope you can read it. The writing is a little small because the comments are in there, which I wanted to have in there. So um, sh uh, Lisa made the comment that uh, one sentence, which she's, uh, which is uh, in pink, may we may want to omit. But um, I don't know what you're doing. I am passing out because this is. I, I mean, I saw the comment that said somebody had made a comment, and I don't know if this was the one that I had mentioned about aligning our diversity statement. So I just um, grabbed the three statements that we have, and then actually Judith remind me, reminded me we've got one in the justice system goal as well. Um, so the village values on the top, uh, HRC mission statement, and then this vision policy statement. So. This was the one request I made that we align the groups that we're talking about. Um, it doesn't seem like okay. it should be different for each one. Is it aligned or is it not aligned? They're not exactly the same. Yeah, they've got different, you know, like the housing vision has got um, lifestyles and skills, well, which is not in any of the others. I mean, I, I mean, it's a different purpose, too. Okay. I mean, for example, a lifestyle might impact housing. Uh -huh. It might not impact uh, HRC or the village. I mean, I'm talking about like maybe someone wants to live in a tiny house. That's a lifestyle. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, so well, that's the question. There are some other things that would make sure. sense yeah. to. I mean, like sexual orientation yeah. is not in your vision yeah. statement. So I just think we need to see what's relevant to what and not have a different statement each time and, and leave things out. Well, and Judy did just point out that the, the number three village value is recent. It's, you know, this year or, and the HRC mission statement has not been updated to reflect that. So that, that may be one of the things, Kevin, that you need to do, but maybe that would be align those more closely. But there, but there are things in the HRC one that we would want to remain yeah. there. Like and, and actually, I mean, I think lifestyle, we should be welcoming to all lifestyles and, and skills. I mean, I think they could all Yeah, they apply. could all just be added to end. Well, I would like to get this approved. <laughs> so well, let's just, so uh, is, what do we need to do to get this statement approved? I, well, do you want to make a uh, motion to... Yeah, I, I yeah. Amend. So I would just say uh, you want it amended to include all those things. Yeah, let's just include all the things. All the things where in the value, the village well, value I, number three. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, where I, this requires how? So it would be in the sentence that says this requires housing that enables people of blah blah blah. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's a matter of making sure that you, if you just hit all the points, just. Okay. Combine them all together and get right. one. Well, I mean, you know, if we agree the in board, theory yeah. that we like this statement, I can check and make sure. Frankly, that I think it's, I, I don't. I mean, to I'm me, not gonna, I'll, I'll yeah, stand exactly. in the way. I don't right. think it's that relevant. I'm but right. if you rest, you do. I'd rather get it done. Yeah, I'm not going to stand in the way either. But if we're talking specifically about housing, I mean, is there something about housing development that makes it specific to sexual orientation or something about housing that? You know, I mean, to me, uh, housing is a different, kind of a different, well, uh, it's a subtopic, you know? 
Well, no. there's disability. No. Yeah, so you yes. don't, these we, things you don't are think disability? Yeah. Are. These things no, are I, but, well, some of, I mean, it doesn't hurt to have them all, but I just am not okay. sure so that all of them map the housing. Let's stick them all in there, plus oh, okay. I, I wanted to, there, disability is not in the. Well, ability is. Abilities. And we, yeah. And, and Ability. so, because it's, it saying. covers mental and physical. Okay. So, in that uh, third sentence, it would include all of the things plus the things that are already in there. Like, well, let's see. We have age, only it's skills. Sexual orientation isn't there. Gender identity isn't there. I just put them all in there. Yeah, just put them all in there. Yeah, all in there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So put them all. I can just quickly draft that statement, but otherwise we can approve it, right? All right. Okay. I did have a question on the the housing trust fund. Are you imagining that like the um, we're, green we're space fund? Uh, a list of potential general strategies. Oh, okay, but that's not I'm what sorry. we're doing right now. I thought we were done. No, <laughs> I, was I, I, I don't know if we're done or not. It I, like I, it was I wanted to pull this out and have council approve oh, oh, oh. the vision and, look at the whole thing. Okay. and policy statement. So is everyone comfortable if Brian includes all the stuff in there that we Should just we talked just about? about this? I can't see your screen. Yeah. Our, so is so this is fine. And what was the other thing? Oh, Here. I if Brian puts in everything that's in village value number three into the vision and policy statement, does council approve that? I'm seeing a shake. Well, Kevin well, I, I am agreeing that yes, I think the the modification needs to include the most inclusive statement. What, whether that means taking it exactly in village value number three is, is may or may not be the point. But as long as it is the as it is the most inclusive, because mm -hmm. that's two different things. Taking everything is one thing. Taking it just out of village value number three is excluding some things. So I think Brian's I idea was that we add all of the things. Right. All three yep. of those. Right. Which right. Sounds good. If that's what we're doing. I'll make a motion yes. that we do that. So okay. just a clarifying question: Are we saying the word skills, which I think is a good word for housing, skills and lifestyles? We'll stay. Oh, so you're going to add skills and lifestyles to the value? To extend well, we won't take it out of the housing one because I, I realize that that's relevant. Um, and How is it relevant? I'm, I don't really want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and I will think about and propose whether it should be in our other okay. statements. Because lifestyles is sort of sexual orientation and gender identity and. It's a euphemism, maybe. Right. Anyway. Styles is pretty broad. I, I mean, when I put it in there, I was thinking of like someone older wants to live on one floor, mm -hmm. um, someone uh, who loves like likes to live with a lot of people wants to live in a communal communal mm -hmm. household. Uh, mm -hmm. I, mean, I thought about skills because house. we want we and want people to come here that are gonna live, I'm, work, and, and play. I was thinking of living and working, and it might mean mm -hmm. someone has their business in their house. Mm -hmm. So those two things. Do, does this with. obligate you in any way legally? If my lifestyle is that I want roosters, that's my lifestyle. I like roosters. <laughs> yeah. Really? Because and I want a sheep too, by the way. And also I'd like that's my lifestyle. I am coming from a rural community and I want to live here. I'm just wondering how much this obligates you to because that is very open ended. Well, we have zoning and rules yeah. and things like that. Do we need to yeah, say <laughs> as long as they're within the bounds of existing <laughs> zoning? So Judith made a motion, um, which I think was the most inclusive statement. I'd do it to all three. Yes. Uh, just, nah, I don't know. We don't need to talk about all three. I don't think we need to talk all right. about all three. Is there a second? Second. That's all. Okay. All those in favor? Yeah, signify by saying. Yeah. What are we voting? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what that motion is. Are we voting on? Putting the values mm -hmm. in the village values no. number three mm -hmm. into the housing. No, no, that all three we would put all the different things because some have. And Brian offered oh, to do it in a way that sounds like anything a good that's listed in any in three, three of these yeah. things yeah. goes into the house. Into goes into the house. We're not saying we're changing to this okay. moment. We're not talking about HRC or village value number three. We're about changing them at all. We're going to all those things into this. Yes. Statement. 
and you're going to do it. Yeah. And that's what we're voting on right now. Right. So okay. you're going to rewrite so it to, to, to the most vote. inclusive yeah. possible yeah. statement. Yes. 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 Um, I, I like that positive framing. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Now, does anyone have any other comments about the rest of this? I just want to make sure we don't forget that Green County Regional Planning is a great resource for us because they basically work for, like they, you know, they did the mock-up for Glass Farm a while yeah. back, but they basically work for, you know, whatever they pay their, um, uh -huh. you know, planner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're a member and they do quality work that's inexpensive. So, so I just want to keep them in the mix. So did you, are you wanting to add that into <laughs> this thing or are you just wanting the Housing Advisory Board to now I saw something that, well, because you have that section about identifying resources, resources. so I just didn't want, didn't want us to forget them. Is that we don't list, well, okay, I'll just write that in for right now. That's Green County Regional Planning. Okay, anything else, Judith? Well, and then I just, uh, my, the, the Housing Trust Fund, and you're imagining that to be something like the Green Space Fund? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Then, uh, just to update you, we have talked to Patrick Solon, who's going to come to our Housing Advisory Board, board as pro bono before he comes to the August 20th meeting at Council. So, mm. sometime this month, and we're in the process of working on that. So, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Done. Great. Okay. So now we got to make some decisions. Um, Wait a minute. Yes. Are you going to goals? You want to do the mayor's recommendation number one just to report? Was that an old business, I think? Uh, yeah. Well, I, mean, okay, we I, I was going to talk okay. about goals, but That's we fine. can. No, no, no. Um, but I guess I'm going to start making some proposals uh, so that we're not here until midnight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't know how deeply everybody looked at the goals, um, but I have to say personally, I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> I mean, if you look at what we said we were going to do, huh? who put it together? We Ooh. did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but we all had our goals yeah. we were in charge of. But if you look at the actions that we've outlined for 2018, uh -huh. almost everything is done or in process. And so I was like, wow, I, it hadn't occurred to me. And, and that was part of our you know, goal this year, as we said, let's try to think about what we can reasonably do. We have that other section of things moving forward. Um, I did flag some questions about things that I wasn't sure if we were going to still try to get them done this year. Um, but I would be comfortable with moving this to uh, a next meeting. Um, unless you guys want me to go through the things I flagged, but we've got some other items I think we want to do tonight. So you just want to set this discussion? I think so, and I can also, you know, what I can do is I can turn this into a document like Karen used to do, color-coded, and because there were just some question marks, you know, there were a couple things with the justice system task force or justice system goal. I wasn't sure if we were still trying to do and a couple other ones. Um, and I think then we could pick up the discussion um, at the next meeting. I had some little edits on it, so we can just okay. send that to you. Sure. Yeah, why don't we just all <laughs> okay. send. All right, so, like so I'll meeting. commit to doing an updated document of sort of like what we've done, what's in process, what we need to decide if we still want to do. Um, but yeah, I, I think we're doing pretty well. <laughs> so, I had the same reaction. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, you know, it's always tough to look at goals mid-year. Well, I, I, I just want to mention that I'm really proud of my staff. Yes. I just want to mention that I, <laughs> I'm really proud of my staff and the work oh. that everybody has done in the first six months of this year. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that's that whole other document. Yes. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. It goes with the goals, though. That's, mm -hmm. that's yeah. that we went through the goals and Melissa created that document when she was here and Go team YS. Right, and that could and that could be updated a little bit too. You yeah. know, when we it, look at this, it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Apropos of staff, I am I'm very concerned that uh, when we have our 
active council, activist council, and active commissions that we're not overloading staff. Mm -hmm. That is a big concern of mine. And in order for council to know, that means that staff have to let whoever their supervisor is yes. and then ultimately you. Yes, and that was going to be part of my part of the discussion um, when we go over this. Um, mm -hmm. because I, I appreciate that you're cognizant of it very much so um, and staff is working really hard but um, you know and, and I'm also concerned that commission that I thought we I think we have a procedure for commission people to re, to talk to staff which I think is for the council liaison on the commission to contact you, if it's you, mm -hmm. or in the case of the mayor's court, mm -hmm. it would be the mayor to say, we want this information. And then then yes. that commission person should contact. And I'm not sure that that's happening all the time. And I think it needs to happen. And I, I would like to have reports back from you and from the mayor, I guess, um, saying, you know, good staff you know, we're not, staff isn't overloaded or, oh, you know, staff is going to have to take more time on this issue because they have other things. So I don't think we're not working on it, but we have other things. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to flag <clears throat> one thing tonight, though, because the one goal that I, I think we do have some things that we need to complete ASAP, and Krista's here to remind us of that are the two um, underneath our third goal. Um, so these are the ones that say we're going to review and confirm our urban, urban service boundary, and then we're going to agree on the properties that are going to be prioritized. Um, and I know that that is, those are things that Krista and Tecumseh Land Trust need right away. So I would specifically be thinking where is about it? Where those. is it on our goals? This yeah. is on the second page at the top about the um, green belt. So it's not here, though. It, it's, it's in the goals. It's in the other document. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh, actually, Patty, maybe I'll get with you about how we can make sure about number one, because we talked to Green County Regional Planning about that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that was the one that I, I think there are some that we don't necessarily, we could not prioritize anymore this year, but those we need to because of the, the funding. So, okay. Mm -hmm. And how do you, I mean, you know, we did have an executive session where we talked about particular properties and we didn't, so the first thing we need to do is we need to be sure that the urban yeah. service boundary that's being it's showed on that map is is accurate mm -hmm. and then I think we can have the policy discussion that number two is about okay. and so, so I'll make sure the first one happens okay. and I'll try to and I think we can confirm that for our meeting on the 16th mm -hmm. so then we'll have a map that we know is correct okay. does that work mm -hmm. okay cool all right so to be continued. And uh, last piece of old business is uh, an update of where we're at with the mayor's court. Okay, so there were two meetings with staff. Oh, the second one today probably is the most relevant to this. Um, we asked to talk, uh, Lisa and I met with Patty, Chief Carlson, um, Pam, and uh, Mayor Pam, and uh, Ann Porter, that was their part of the time, <coughs> about, uh, you know, uh, and so basically, Chief Carlson has given us a draft of his ideas of what uh, could be mandated to go to mayor's court, would always go to mayor's court, and what would not. And so there's just some work we need to, be, to do with it. And so we're uh, going to see about uh, if uh, the data committee will, will help with some of that. And then if JSTF wants to take one more look at it, so what were we thinking? We would be bringing it back to council. That well, no, I, th I thought we said in, in that second meeting in August, I thought. But may maybe, I don't know. I'm just trying to think, because we need to have time to bring it to JSTF yeah. and see if, and um, so, yeah. So can I, can, I raise, can I raise a question? So whereas, whereas if I understood JSTF's role um, was to make the proposal, I mean, have, have they? They've already made that proposal. So Lisa was 
feeling was they didn't really want to see it again. They let it up, well, but I was I missed the last two well, weeks because I was this out is what on I medical thought. leave. So. I mean, I, can you lean back just just while I'm talking? So I'm not. <laughs> um, it's my never mind. Okay. Um, I was at the last justice system task force, and my sense was that they they would welcome taking a look at this, but they didn't want to engage in yet another round of proposal development yeah. that they made their proposal. So um, I think one piece of work that the JSTF might help with that could be done quickly that would just help the council to know what they're looking at is that um, the Justice System Task Force did this report that actually listed by number charge statutes. And then when the chief gave us a document, yeah. he used a uh, slightly different language to group things together. So for example, what he called MM-M4 criminal violations, it, that covers like a whole bunch of things on this form. If you don't know what an MMM4 cr criminal violation is, you don't really you know don't exactly what that is. Right. So even having someone from Justice System Task Force who's really uh, familiar with these, to take a yellow highlighter and just go like zoop, 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 so we can look <laughs> at that and understand what Chief is really recommending, I think would be helpful for counsel. It should take 15 minutes. So. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> okay, it should take four hours. I mean, I, but, I, mean, I just don't time. think it's not that much work. I think where I'm coming from is at first we should look at what Chief is recommending because it seems pretty um, it's a you know a lot mm -hmm. of what he's saying can go to to, to can go to mayor's court and 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 mayor Penine indicated that she felt comfortable with it and as quickly as we could make that decision she would be ready to take it on so I think since the last time we had this conversation yeah. a lot of progress has been made and I think mayor Canine is working, I mean, there's, it was just so obvious how much work she's doing with Anne and how much work the chief is doing on this too. So it didn't drop, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. okay, so uh, this is simplest, I'm looking at it in a simplistic way, and of course it's probably not. What <coughs> I understood was Justice System Task Force said, everything that can legally go to mayor's court should go to mayor's court. Mm -hmm. The chief and maybe the mayor also said well we think there should be some discretion in some mm -hmm. so what i'm looking for what is like everything that can legally go to mayor's court goes to mayor's court except for certain mm -hmm. things right and a rationale mm -hmm. for why those certain things mm -hmm. wouldn't be going to mayor's court right and also that officers are trained because i don't think they are Everything that can go to mayor's court goes to mayor's court unless there's some good reason it doesn't. And I, I would have thought that was happening, but I'm not sure that it's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's a concern. Uh, I, I think it is happening, Marianne. I think you're saying the same thing that we're, we've all been working towards and, and some of the statistics bear out is already happening. And the discussion today, part of the discussion today was how do we track why things that maybe go this way or that way, if they're sent to Xenia, how do we track why they're sent to Xenia? For instance, one of the things that Chief brought up today as a perfect example was, if you're from out of state and you get a traffic ticket in the village of Yellow Springs, right now you can't pay it online to be done with it, but if you get cited to Xenia, then you can pay it online, which makes it simpler for you when you get home. Uh, or if you have multiple charges, and some of them can go to mayor's court, but some of them have to go to Xenia, the question is, do you cite to two different courts, or do you make it, you know, save the person actually money by sending them all to Xenia? And what we've talked about is how to track why those things are happening. So is it your uh, understanding that the sergeants and the people that are training the new officers are instructing them that this is what we want? That is what the chief has been telling me, yes. So yes, that's my understanding. But I think, um, you know, once we get this work done, it'll be a lot more specific and yes. clear. Okay. And, and there was the idea of 
if there's some area of for some re there's some area of discretion where you know it's kind of middle level where most of it will go to Mary's court we might be asking for information about sort of so we can understand why, why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the chief even went so far as to have the idea that we would add a numeric designation on the log that's you know in the dispatch log when they call in to say they're done with whatever it is that the numeric designation indicates their rationale for the choice that they've made right uh, then and uh -huh. there so it could be really very real time mm -hmm. you know you come in in the morning and take a look at last night's law you know mm -hmm. data kind of thing mm -hmm. okay thank you okay on to new business and the first item we have there is a proposal from the Tecumseh Land Trust to once again sponsor the annual harvest auction and the request is for $250 uh, which puts us at what level? Red barn? Red tractor? <laughs> Okay. Oh, green tractor. Okay. Green. I think it's green. It's All right. <laughs> All right. Green tractor. Green tractor. Um, and so we. Yes. Green. Green tractors. Yeah. So we've sponsored this event before. Um, you know, this is part of our process where nonprofits can come directly to us. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? I'd like to make a motion, if I can, that we go ahead and uh, do this. Make okay. this. Second. Right. I'll second it. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Next up, um, this was actually something I put on there. Uh, I was looking. I know. See, surprise. <laughs> uh, I figured you would wonder. Um, I looked through. I figured it was you. Yes. I looked through all our commissions and I was updating things just to you know make sure we had the correct liaisons and alternates. And it occurred to me since this you know committee has maybe a more formal role in some ways it might make sense to appoint a, an alternate um i i guess i have viewed this as a subcommittee of the environmental commission okay now, i don't know whether that's actually how it's listed or whether we want it to be i think great. it makes sense so if okay. it were a subcommittee of the environmental commission then i think it makes sense for the liaison to be the liaison for the environmental commission, mm -hmm. commission which i think is you, yeah, me. Okay. Are you, are you cool? Um, so, uh, so let me just make sure I know what I'm committing to. So it, what, in my experience, when I've gone to the meetings for Environmental Commission, they're talking about glass farm management as part of that agenda, right? Yeah, something right. I mean, up, yeah. it's already, I mean, like, I remember a conversation about, like, what are the implications of the protected area when there's development going on, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not... So then I think there is a special committee though, and it sometimes will meet. It, I think it's twice. A, it needs to meet twice a year. I see. And I don't know if it's met this year. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if I'm, I'm glad I can, I can take on a couple meetings more a year. <laughs> see. <laughs> I'd rather not take on another meeting a month. But it'll be meeting for, well, probably for going in and getting rid of the honeysuckle and some of the things that are popping up there. Yeah. Just so let me know. Kind of Whatever yeah. helps. And then are you the alternate for environmental commission? I'm the alternate. You're the alternate. Yeah. And you're the, okay, gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Um, all right, next item is uh, village manager search process. Um, and we put this on the agenda just to start a discussion. Um, do we want to? Well, well I, you I, want to take five minutes? Yes, I would okay. like to. Yes. Because I think I want to get started on it. And I, I'm wondering, Judith, if you want to say a little bit about, you've been in. Oh, about past processes? Yeah, I mean, what, um, what's happened in the past that you think is, would make sense for us to do? And Well, I think we should, you know what I think makes more sense than trying, me trying to dredge up exactly what we did is to get the documents from, the one that I was involved in is the one where we hired Mark Kunda. Um, I mean, that was the main one. And, um, and I thought it was a pretty good process. But I think it makes sense to kind of go back and get the documents. Right. Did we get that from? Get those, you know. From and, Judy? And I understood that the process by which we hired Patty also seemed like a good process. Right. We so also had a consultant. We could look at both of those. Yeah, both us. we had a consultant. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can tell you that the process that I went through, quite good, I thought. the process that I went through to get hired here was the most exhaustive process I've ever gone through for any public was service job, but it was a really good process, I felt. Yeah. I, mean, I think I, I could look I, at both of them and, or yeah. look at that one and, like, and, and, and the problem was similar. Still, again, still having fun um, after, at the end of two days. Of, <laughs> yeah. Pretty exhausting. See? <laughs> pretty exhausting. So. Especially when you got to tackle that case study, right? The case, which one? <laughs> you remember. Case. It's just a mental block now. Yeah. Yeah. We have two council people that were sort of leading the charge. Jerry and I. Yeah. So yeah. to me, it seems to make sense. And I'm not proposing who would be on it, but I, I'd like to develop a timeline. Mm -hmm. And I would be happy to help create a timeline, maybe for our next. Well, why don't we get the documents about how it was done last time? Right. I mean, it might be good to look at that, and then you, and then they had a timeline. Yeah, yeah I know. I know our probably, process you know. had a timeline. Yeah, yeah so. I was going to say rather than trying I, to create a new timeline. Yeah, and I think those documents are floating around somewhere in my office, but I mean, I can tell you no, most I'm, of it. Yeah. I have. And I'd, I'd like. It took about six months. I will tell you. Right. That. So that means we finish. need to get started. And I'd like to propose that we implement the Art Rooney rule. Um, so in the National Football League, um, the Art Rooney rule uh, states that you have to interview a minority candidate for every position. So obviously we can't promise jobs and, and, and um, you know, we still got some work to do on codifying all of what we want to do in terms of diverse hiring practices. But I would think for this position, I think we could, I think we should commit to at least interviewing um, a, a diverse candidate. I thought that was in our yeah. policy. I thought that was our policy we, that we if you. We haven't all no. worked on it. it no, it, it and is I want in the proposed. I did, I did put a draft proposal together. I sent it to Kevin, and I should probably send it on to you. That I mean, I sent it to Kevin because I thought we, if he had any additions, I don't know if he did. Um, then yeah. I would send it on to uh, staff, and we were going to meet together. Yeah, but I haven't yeah. done that. I, that gone to that step yeah. yet. Yeah, I but thought I we were just trying to schedule a meeting, though. Mm -hmm. but, oh, yeah. okay. I see. Yeah. One of the things that you need to keep in mind when you're developing your timeline is how much overlap you want this person to have with me. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Okay, so we'll have those documents in the packet for our July 16th meeting. So that will be a discussion item. Yes. Maybe we could look at both of those processes. I don't yeah, know. I'd like to. Them. Yeah, because we didn't. We actually didn't pull out your guys' oh, process, so I'd like to see it. Yeah. Um, and it cool. Um, okay, Kevin, HRC nomination. Real quick, uh, Deborah Williamson. Um, Marianne and I spoke with her today. Deborah uh, used to be part of HRC. In fact, she was chair of HRC for a while. Um, so. We talked to her. She's got great ideas. I'm all excited. Won't spend a lot of time, but I'd like to nominate her uh, formally. And, and she has uh, leadership experience. She's done uh, different kinds of projects, different kinds of leadership stuff, and a particular interest in uh, working with differently abled populations. Differently And she ran a successful conference twice at Antioch University Midwest when she was on the HRC related to that. So yeah, she's right. great. I will second that nomination. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, Patty. Um, you mentioned, I think earlier, Brian, the implicit bias training that is yes. coming up in August. Um, mm -hmm. At the next meeting, council will see a, um, a resolution to renew the Rumkey contract that it provides for, the current contract had three one-year extensions in it. This is the second one-year extension um, that we are recommending uh, we move forward with. And you can see there it's a 3% it's a increase, but what that means is anywhere between 34 and 40 cents, depending on which tier you're in. Mm -hmm. So it's 34 for the lowest tier, then 37 for tier two and 40 cents for tier three. Um, and that's a per month increase. So um, it is, if we go back out for, forbid again, it would likely be much higher. So we've got good service from Rumpke. We believe, we are, staff is recommending that we renew the contract. Um, Rumpke will get me the addendum and we'll have that at the next meeting. Um, the most important thing in my entire report 
is that I am on vacation next week. <laughs> wow. Um, I, it's not that I will be unreachable, but I will be at my dad's uh, for most of the week. Johnny will be here, and uh, you can contact him with any concern. Okay. So are the crew quarters going to? The crew quarters are done except for cleaning. Johnny's making the contractor clean the inside of them because they're dusty. <laughs> But the crew quarters, Judy, did he send that? No. Oh, I have one picture, but um, you go ahead and talk while I get it to Judy real quick. And hopefully. I don't we... have that ability. I'm not connected to the Oh, you're not connected to the internet. Can you plug that into my phone? Mm -hmm. No. Well, okay, well, you can sorry. E we'll you can email it. it out. I will email it out. Um, anything else, Patty? Uh, no, everything else is in there. Okay, the one thing I wanted to mention is in preparation for our July 30th infrastructure work session, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would at least like to meet with um, sort of our key presenters, you know, I you, Johnny, and whoever. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if another council member is interested, but I'd like, I would love to. Okay, but I, I'd like to really think about that plan. So we can do it the week after you get back from vacation. Actually, why don't we do it the week before the, the present, early in the week before the presentation? Because the week I come back is the week we're finalizing, unless you want to oh, be part of the finalizing. Yeah. Okay, well, back. as soon as possible, just okay. to make sure that we've got a good focused presentation, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris? All right, Judy? Just thanks for everyone stepping up and helping out, especially Patty and staff. Team YS. Yes, welcome back. Yeah. Um, all right, so future agenda items. Yeah, we also have a report from Lawrence. We do. Okay, and wasn't on the agenda, but I'd love to. Well, I really appreciate it. I that don't was know great. if you want to talk about it, but. Well, in my job description when I was hired, it said three months. I've been here three months and I've been working, so this is just a report for what I've done and who I've helped and resources that we've used. Mm -hmm. It's good to have the report. Yeah, It'd be yeah. great to have you talk about it. Yes. Thank yeah. you. What are, what are some of the high points real quick, Lawrence? Um, so, uh, so you've made, uh, I see three referrals for drug and alcohol um, services and so. Well, yes. Um, I have listed the ones that we've used there that I've done everything on here we've used in as a referral. So we get a call or um, something happens, one of the officers, somebody comes in or somebody calls and reports, you know, care of the family, somebody's in mental distress or something. Mm -hmm. And so I've referred them to these places mm -hmm. over on the other side of the resources. Um, TCN, which is a mental health, um, mm -hmm. the community network have, has a lot of them. We've had um, anonymous donors and the local churches to um, provide for um, utility payments and rent payments. And we have um, referrals to the Treehouse, which is a drug and alcohol recovery place, and the Hope Spot, which also helps with mental um, capacity and drug rehabilitation the food bank we've had requests um, the food trucks that come out here they also help um, we've had um, homeless um, referrals to the daybreak facility and um, one to the st. Vincent de Paul um, I'll answer any questions you have it's you know, I, have, I have a question when you do a referral do you do you ever find out whatever came of it? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, because, um, for instance, the St. Vincent de Paul referral, it was for a homeless person, and I gave the information to the person who was assisting at that point, and the person wasn't there at the time, so I don't have the information as to whether they actually report it there. We gave them the referral, and it's up to them to either use it or not, I'm pretty sure they did because they were homeless, but I don't, they don't send me back something saying, your person showed up. Right. You know. I mean, I, well, I guess what I'm wondering is if, um, if there's a way to ask people if we're referring them. Um, I don't know, is there some way for us to you know, get that follow-up information? Well, I mean, just to be, know, no. just to, just maybe to say to them so we can understand, you know, how 
if we're able, if we're finding resources for them that are really helpful for them. All the all these resources on this side, except for that last one, I know that did get did they, get support they, yes, services through. Yes. Them. Okay. Um, like I said, that one was the homeless person, and I didn't have contact information, right. yeah, so there's I no see. way that I, I can. So you kind of follow up afterwards. Mm -hmm. so, what is YSHSRO? Oh. What is what? Uh, under May activities, I was thinking it was, is it YS High School? YS Yellow Springs oh, Resource um, uh, Officer, School Resource Officer. Gotcha, right. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate, obviously, you jumped right in mm -hmm. and made those contacts, which is super important. So, for, for, I have a question. Yes. Help, help me understand um, the difference between the numbers that are bolded and not bolded. I see how you have the, when I try to do the column totals, for example, uh, TCN on resources is mm -hmm. 11, but it you know, when you total, it's not bolded, it's not, like the numbers that are. Or is it just an accident? <laughs> I just didn't bold that total, total column, is what you're saying? When, no, um, if you look at the resources for April to June, um, the total at the bottom is 12, but if you add all of them up, it's uh, 23 to 27. So the top three aren't added into your total. I think oh. that's why he's what oh, I yeah. was asking. Probably so. Well, so they, it just didn't get it added just didn't in. yes okay so, so it's, it's actually all yeah. Yeah. And like I said just and maybe it just maybe it's my screen it looks like no, it some of them are bolded yeah, and yeah. some are not okay across the board when I went down okay yeah good catch sure okay. how um how is it going yeah that's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> how's it going yeah. wonderful um I think we've been able to assist a number of people who really um needed the assistance um, and I think that um, ongoing people get to know me in the community trust that I'm here to help them and I'm not the enemy <laughs> because I'm associated with the police department um, but I think all in all that um, the citizens who've used this really appreciate having someone to help them because we've had um, people who live out of town who have people who are in town elderly or with some mental capacity for need and they come and meet with me and they we work out a plan a safety plan a plan so that you know people are out of town are not worried about the people that are living here in the village not being able to get resources when they need them because the family member is out of town right. so we've had we've had a number of cases um, elderly who might have a little mental um, disorientation at times, just need a little bit of help or just a little service, someone, you know, that they can call on or mm -hmm. be referred to. And so that's just what we're doing. We're just helping the people in the village of Yellow Springs, be it residents or visitors. Because a lot of these, um, sometimes we get requests from people who are just passing through who need a little help right. or something. Okay. So um, cool. I'm enjoying the the work that I'm doing and um, hopefully it's a benefit and people are seeing that it's a benefit to the yeah. village. I was, was going to suggest an article and it might be, I don't know if you feel like you're far enough along in your work, but just uh, at some point a report that the public would really get a, a picture of what you're doing. Might well, be, right now. Might be nice. Maybe it's too early. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Right it's now we're time. with the suicide um, reports that have been in the newspaper, I think it's very helpful to the community. Yeah. Um, because even though there have been some completions of suicide, there have been people who have gotten information to help them to decide against suicide also. Uh -huh. So I think um, the newspaper's doing a very yeah. good job no, of, an of following up on what's going on yeah. in lieu of what's happening in the village. All right. Good. All right. All right. Thank you, Florence. Yeah, thanks, Florence. Yes. I just wanted to thank you uh, and thank the council and Patty and everybody who, who made your position possible. Uh, I think it's, it's brilliant and a little obvious that the police, that law enforcement should have someone in social work to deal with behavioral health issues. It's exactly in keeping with what was being discussed at the uh, New Year's Eve uh, event. Uh, 
And I urge you also, uh, with Judith, to document and, and show, you know, write your stuff and make a record so we can see the impact that, that this is having. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm try, trying to do. And also, I, I, I'm helping with the police department because this, our police are in a lot of stress and strain in different situations where we have to look at them and treat them as people in the village need mm -hmm. help also. Mm -hmm. So the police training and the things that the police need to um, follow up on and get help with themselves. So it's part of that. It's not just isolated. To, yeah, no, it's it's the whole community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's great. Okay. Future agenda items. So we've added council goals back. Yep. And village and, manager process. Yep. And then we have mayor's court on the 20th. Uh, keep in mind, we do not have a meeting mayor's on Wait, what August six. Did Didn't you say mayor's court was going to be talked about on August? Yeah, 4? the more definitive well, list of charges that. Well, the housing advisory Patrick Bowen Cummings is going to be talking with council about housing targets, housing goals. That's going to take a chunk. Okay, so can we do it on Is September fourth? Uh, in terms of mayor's court. Yes. Yeah, I think that's. Fine. Okay. I, I'm concerned about whether or not we'll have CIC bylaws by August twentieth. I'd like to think that we will, but at the last conversation of council, what I took was your. We'll take your feedback back to ESC. And so I think we need to get really clear about the initial scope of our DCIC because then I think writing the, the, the document around it is more of a legal activity. If, if I could ask a question about that. In, in terms of the scope, are you talking about the makeup of it? Because typically the, the code of regulations bylaws are written in a, in a relatively broad way. Um, yeah, so I think that there's a pretty, I, and I appreciate that, um, but I think there are some uh, pretty specific uh, ways in which we want our code of regulations to indicate certain things that our, like DCIC might not do. So I think we have to all agree as a council on how we write those before we bring them. So that's for July 16th. Are no, it's uh, on for August 20th. August 20th. No. No, it's for July 16th it's and quite. August 20th. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I, I'm just a little bit worried about whether we're going to have a draft for, for, our, for, July. for July 16th. Well, I think we're, we're going to at least close. have a, we're at least going to have the first two proposed purpose and yes, structure. Yes, that we have. So, that will and I agree with you. Bylaws are kind of a legal thing. So. Yeah. I mean, we could I mean, there's mechanism. I, I guess what I would say is that I think that there's ways that we can address the, the issues you want to you want to address mm -hmm. and move the process forward because of the bylaws, mm -hmm. they're general governance documents. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have to get into the nitty gritty. Right. right. Well, I, I don't want to slow it down. Right. Because economic development that has to go right along with how, you know housing and keep pushing. Yep. But I just wanted to foreshadow that. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I think if we have a pretty solid idea on the 16th, that gives us a month to come up with a draft at least. That's right. what I had hoped, so, but yeah. I'm a little, if it's looking packed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Anything else? You were Are, saying something about August 6th. What's that? You were saying something oh, about just that we do not have a meeting on August 6th. So I want to make sure that everybody is aware when it is not happening. Um, so if not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. adjourn. So move. move. Well, I'll second Wait, that. I have a <laughs> s the landlord utility responsibility discussion is happening at the next meeting. Uh, yes, it's July 16th, yeah. I guess so. Okay. All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, thanks.